Hello, hello everybody. Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is the first official episode of this amazing cool new podcast idea that I am starting called My Virtual Life, where My Virtual Life, you know, the name of this, is going to be about showing the behind the scenes of what it's like being a content creator, specifically and most importantly, VTubers. And I kind of want to show you all, you know, not just behind the scenes, but sharing all sorts of different perspectives and different just conversations that don't really get talked about here when it comes to being a virtual content creator or just making content. And starting off today, I want to be talking about how talent managers play a big role with VTubers. And so I have my special, lovely, amazing guest. I have Tessa here with me today. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. And Tessa is special because she is expertise, so to say, in this talent management, which is actually kind of an interesting term because I know some people kind of default um, kind of what you do as like just a manager, like a VTuber manager. And I find like this nuance of terminology about it, talent manager to be... Um, kind of fascinating. Like, I'm curious, like, why why do you list yourself as a talent manager? So talent manager is an, a more official term that is used officially in for any entertainers. Like you're thinking um, more like Hollywood, like with celebrities and stuff, but it applies to influencers as well. Um, Cause in like outside of like the VTuber scene um, for general social media stuff, um, people are called social, like social media influencers. They're like a type of celebrity. And so like the people who help them with their marketing, the PR brand deals, um, contracts, they, they court, they help coordinate. Hey, who, what do you need today? Okay. You need this for this kind of stream. Oh, you want to sell this kind of product? Okay. I've got you, I got you covered and we're going to talk about that and that's the kind of routine that a lot of ta talent managers handle. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today, I, I hope. And whether it's called a VTuber manager, a talent manager, a project manager, a lot of it revolves around the same thing. And a lot of VTuber managers are project man managers. A lot of others are more assistants in nature. It depends on who you're talking to. I love that actually. I love that you use the word project manager because uh, funny enough, uh, did you know that I actually uh, am a project manager, but not for like managing talent. Um, I do project management in uh, stream production and like esports. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, and it's a very stressful job. It's a very it stressful job. It it, I mean, you're telling me. Um, but it's like, for project management specifically, it is an official occupation that you can get a degree for, a certification for. There's actually a really, really popular one and world recognized one called the, the PMP. Um, you basically get like certified by having actual experience and you can qualify for that. And it's like kind of like a, I forget how much it is to, you gotta like take an exam and then you gotta pay for it. Um, but it's 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 an actual job. It's, it's, it's essential for doing so much things in the world. No, I agree. And, you know, part of the reason why I wanted today's very first episode to be talking about this is um, for the past couple of weeks. No, no, not even the past couple of weeks, the past several years, there has been this ongoing debate about like VTuber managers, talent managers, content creation strategists, you know, the whole like bubble of like management for whenever it comes to talent. And I kid you not, like, I think this year we have been seeing more people being more aggressive towards the conversations about it and i've always wanted to like sit down and like have a talk but since i'm not a a talent manager like i don't have the expertise to be able to really comment right. a lot about this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's completely understandable and it's because like there's the so starting off like what does a project manager like do besides like what i mentioned like you know doing marketing you know so a lot of, kind of like starting with the baseline because there's all sorts of specializations one can have so i would say kind of like a baseline for a, of what a lot of people do as as talent managers is at the very least they do a lot of networking they do a lot of um analysis of data for like the content creation side of things 
Um, like we're talking like opening up your Twitch streamer dashboard, YouTube studio, um, looking at your socials in general and just kind of figuring out, okay, what's working, what's not working. Okay. Has anything changed? since we first talked okay and you just have this ongoing relationship with your client to determine what the best course of action is and being able to work around those lines of like okay what is best for what we need to do here because if you this is where my own personal philosophy comes in and a lot of other talent managers that uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> a lot of other talent managers actually um feel the same way too um and a lot of them do work at like companies like MSM Talent, Mythic Talent, and other kind of things. And a lot of people don't really know what those kind of companies do. And I'm free to explain the difference between something like MSM, um, Mythic Talent, and like Hololive and other kind of places. Because talent managers are seen there too. And a lot of them do the exact same kind of stuff, just for a different type of company. And oftentimes when you have a, a manager, they can take the form of different roles. So with the whole reaching out for like a partnership, getting brand deals, getting like other kind of opportunities, like let's say for example, I had Mari, Mari came, like let's just say one day Mari comes to me with like an opportunity and she says, oh my God, Tessa, Tessa, um, I'm gonna get a voice actress for a role. Oh my I'm god, like, I really do sound like this though. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> but Tessa, I want to be a voice actress. And I'm just gonna be like, oh, good, Murray. What are they offering you? Oh, it's a, it's not a paid opportunity, but and I'm like, nope, stop there. <laughs> but they said they'll give me free cookies. <laughs> it's like, no, we need, we need the monies. We, we you have labor that you're giving them and oh what's this in the contract oh they want to use your voice for ai oh my god we're not gonna do that because you know why they're gonna just rip off your voice and then never hire you again and you know what's funny that you bring this up i actually did get an offer like that before <laughs> and, and they, I, I have gotten an offer like that before and the amount of <laughs> And, yeah. You said yes. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not say yes. But the fact that Imagine I don't know. You think you're gonna get on, on stream that you took an offer like that? Oh my god. <laughs> no, no, I would never just say yes to something without discussing. And okay, so <laughs> see, I th this is exactly yeah, why. <laughs> That's why. Oh, shit. <laughs> I would, I would never, I would, I, I re listen, I read my emails, I do, and I don't click on any suspicious links. Usually if a company sends me an email, I don't click on any links. I just Google them first to see if it's legit, if what they're talking about is legit. And then if I'm still unsure, that is when I will send it to my manager, say, hey, can you like vet this for me? Can you like make sure? Can you make verify sure if this is an actual thing, if it's legitimate? And can you like do like a quick background check? And that's, that is what a lot of the job is. And I also write a lot of emails for people and like when Mari needs stuff as well, I will do the same thing. And whether or not I'm the one writing the email or she, I'm just kind of like on a discord call with her, like instructing her through it. That's basically what I, what I'll have to do. And it's not necessarily like in a meeting time or anything. Like I'll just spend time out of my day for like, 15 minutes be like okay mari this is a scam because <laughs> like there's there's so many spam emails and there's also potentially good ones and if those potentially see in business there's a thing called qualifying where um you don't know whether or not a thing is actually worth your time or not and if it is then you kind of set some parameters set some boundaries with that and you kind of work through that the logistics of it and that's often a lot of what a talent manager does is they help with the logistics of all that. And for the project management side of things, for me, it's like, okay, so we see like an offer, right? And it's like this big old event. Like, let's just say she got like an offer to do, I'm going to pull something out of my ass in thin air. Let's just say like Taco Bell wanted to sponsor Mari. You know, a Hail Mary just comes out and drops like, a cheesy gordita on her lap and it's a golden kappa cheesy gordita it has to be crunchwrap that it has to be crunchwrap sorry <laughs> a, a, a golden kappa crunchwrap and suddenly we're looking at an opportunity of a lifetime kind of deal and we ask okay um you want her to do this what do you want her to do 
Exactly. And then they'll give us the details of like, okay, we want you to say, I love Taco Bell Senpai five times in a row every five minutes. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of, that's kind of much. Mari, are you okay with that? And she'll be like, yeah, why not? And I'll be like, Mari, five times in like five minutes is a lot. That's one per minute. Can you do that for like three hours? She's like, oh, probably not. And we'll be like, okay, um, let's email back Taco Bell and be like, hey, could we do it maybe once an hour and have your logo on the screen and take ad breaks every now and then to shill out Taco Bell Sama. And like... <laughs> nah, Taco you're Bell so Senpai, right yeah. though. Also, and I, I don't... <laughs> I just I can't believe you used Taco Bell as an example because right before stream I bought this like did you know you can buy Taco Bell's like this is not a promo this is not sponsored you can you can go to a store like I think it's Walmart you can buy a, ta a Crunchwrap Supreme taco kit and I bought that and I made uh, Crunchwrap Supreme before before lunch before we actually started this so the fact that not only did you call you I did not share this information with you at all. <laughs> So I uh, talk about when am I getting that sponsor? By the way, just <laughs> see that—that's exactly what we're here for. It's like, okay, we want to do this whole big thing, and then we got to think, okay, we got this offer. How do we actually make the most use of it, right? They're gonna give her, okay, let's just say she got like for for every time that someone ordered on their app, like they she would get like five percent kickback, right? And I'd be like, okay, um, so if you want her to do this much and we were to, you know, compromise a little bit, could we maybe do 8%, 10% maybe? And we can have like a call with them and they'll be like, okay, yeah, if you're willing to put in some more effort on marketing, then sure. And we'll have to come up with a budget and be like, okay, what's in the treasury here? Oh, we got, we got $2 and a handshake. All right, so what do we need to do to get about hmm, let's just say a thousand dollars so that we can market everything and we'll be like oh we can we can maybe do a subathon or we can actually like okay what can we do on patreon to do this to get this kind of money by x time and then we start figuring that kind of stuff out and it's like boom we have a, we have a plan to market this out be like oh guess what we're gonna do we're gonna do a collabathon i don't know and we're gonna be like okay so if everyone is here, we're going to be willing to give them like free Taco Bell or something and they get like a coupon in app to get like a free five beefy five layer burrito or something. And Taco Bell can agree to that and be like, yeah, you can give up to 20 friends this code and we'll, we'll talk to our IT department. And it's like suddenly we have, OK, guys, do you want free Taco Bell? And you're starting to get people on collab and it's like, OK, so we're networking, we're pushing this out. All right, cool, we've got a plan. And then actually executing that plan is going to be stressful. And this is where uh, it does differ a bit from manager to manager, whether or not they want to step in and do the extra mile. It's not necessary at all because I get a lot of questions about, OK, what do you need to do as a manager? Because I get I get like emails and DMs from people like I want to say probably like 10, 15 times a month for the past nine months uh oh um you know that's crazy you get you get that's i know that doesn't sound like a lot that sound that that sounds like a lot though it, it, the grand scheme it is um but there's a lot of people who want to do this it's a cool job um and being able to be like okay so we're gonna do this and how long is this campaign gonna take from fundraising to you know doing that collabathon and actually making sales and getting kicked back for that um, that's going to be a stressful, maybe like six month process. Right. Um, and I'll be there for like Mari, for example, for like emotional support and on call kind of like support and be like, okay, so what hiccup did we have today? Okay. Mari, it's 2 AM in the morning. I know you got back, uh, home from your long day at work. Okay. So, um, Taco Bell sent us an email and concern to you, um, uh, cursing at uh, customers during supermarket simulator. I would never do that. I mean, <laughs> no, I no, me uh, never. If we check the security footage, I'm sure we would never find anything there. I don't know. Honestly, oh, wait. It looks like there was a little bit of a lapse in the. Oh, that must have just been a weird frame. Oh th no, I would never do that. <laughs> you know, okay. You know, um, ninety percent of people 
with the word VTuber manager in their bio have no idea what they're doing, at least according to this research that I just completely just made up on social media. However, the fact that you said you get these emails... Not and exactly made up, it's just <laughs> like... It, it is a question that a lot of people have, and that comes mainly from, like, not really knowing what the job entails. And, yeah. But when you do take the, the risk to, to bring on someone, and there's two ways that that happens. Most of the time, it happens through, like, a percentage cut of total revenue, right? So, like, if I were to approach you, for example, and be like, hey, Mari, if you want me to manage you, what's the going rate for this? Okay, so according to the state of California... I could charge me 15%. I don't live in California, but let's just say I did. I'd be like, okay, so I am an officially registered talent manager. Here's my license. Okay. Um, I'm going to Wait, you just said a license. I keep forgetting that. So there is a license. There, there are licenses for like being a talent manager, but like I don't live in a state that actually needs that. And so I haven't had to do it yet. But the fact um, that you just said that is very fascinating to me because like I said, like, okay, just, you know, despite my little funny like comment earlier like as you said there is some truth to what's being said about like you know managers right especially vtuber managers because you know the fact that you said that you you need some states in at least america you would have to have some kind of like license to be like man i find that so fascinating because people don't think it's a it legit really job depends. it really depends because yeah it is a legit job and at some point, I mean, I believe once you earn over, I think this is kind of like a U.S. federal thing. Once you earn over $600, you have to report your income through a 1099 NEC tax form. And the person who's paying you as an independent contractor has to issue that to you. And then you then put, okay, I've received $600 or more for this job. Okay, here you go, IRS Senpai. Here you go. Um, and it works the other way around where if you are, and this is something you and I can probably talk about another time privately, but it's like, if you are commissioning someone over $600 yourself and it's not being handled through like PayPal, Stripe, where they are the ones that issue these kind of forms, you do have to tell the person like, okay, you need to go through and file this this tax form if you're a u.s citizen and you got to get it done b before april 14th um but for me personally i go through stripe and that simplifies a lot of things stripe and paypal simplify a lot of things because they issue you those tax forms and you do have to report that income and for me it's a full-time job and so um reporting a good amount of money i, I don't want to say my salary on stream but um, reporting that amount of money is is just like any other industry, any other job. And yeah, so, yeah. Content creators have to do this too, you know. Like we are self-employed. Yeah, exactly. um, and what's it called? I the way I I have to do my taxes, I don't even want to get into because it's pretty bad. And tax season's coming up soon. It, it's pretty bad what I have to do with my stuff because, and it's not like I'm making crazy amounts of money either. It's just the way taxes are when you are self-employed. It's just a very different way you go about it. So the fact that like, you know, one manager managing is not only just like a legitimate job. It's just interesting because um, sometimes people don't know, OK, well, what makes someone a qualified manager? Because, again, there's this weird like I don't know if it's necessarily a hot takes. So I want to call it like a misconception. There's a misconception that a lot of talent managers don't know what they're doing. Right. And I think that comes from just understanding by the way, I want to answer like one quick question in chat. It's like, is there an official license for strictly VTuber managers? And the answer is for that exact title, technically no. It's it's a brand new kind of specific type of profession, but at the end of the day, you're still a talent manager. And there is a difference. There's an actual factual difference between a talent agent and a talent manager. Those are two different jobs. It's hard. It's it, I don't want to complicate it too much again, two in the weeds, but those are two different uh, designations for occupations. Um, There's so something else like though agent, too. If you just think like agent, those are the ones who strictly are the ones responsible and they make it their sole job to broker deals. And like, think of like an actor getting like a role in a film and an agent is the one that connects them to that. Um, yeah. A manager is the one that manage, is, is, is more or less like a business marketing manager. And in for like VTuber managers, it's a very new industry. So it's like you kind of have to wear a shit ton of hats. 
the thing you know i'm actually kind of glad that you brought that up Oops, because i'm sorry that I, I gotta remember not to curse i don't want to get you demonetized. <laughs> It's not, it's not too, too bad on you. Thankfully, YouTube's been a lot more lenient nowadays. But, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I have, um, for everyone who may or may not know, I have Tessa as my manager. However, I am also with the uh, agency called V-Roots. And so what you mm -hmm. just said is exactly why, because people are like, wait, I thought you were with this. Because some people might think that you're in V-Roots and stuff, which it's, you're not. It's like, these are two very different things, like what you had just said. Like, you specifically... Um, you you probably can phrase this better than I can, but like you basically help me with my day to day operations, whereas Vroots helps me with the like the like financial side of it. I think I'm understanding that correctly. Um, so Vroots how they would be your talent agents in yeah. this case, where they're the ones help, more focused on helping getting you those brand deals and opportunities. Whereas for me, I do handle that when I can time to time, but my focus is more on managing your projects, more on looking at your data. And okay, so especially with the YouTube side of things and working with um, your branding, working with your actual video scripts and ideas and making sure that everything flows and your, the quality of your, of your videos improve. Um, and Which, thank you, Bob, for that, by the way. Thank you. Just so, in case if anyone didn't know, all the videos, not not to cut you off, but in case if anyone didn't notice the quality of the videos changing, that is because Tessa and I have, like, literally hours upon hours have gone through, and the amount, the amount of scripts I have sent her, and she's like, Mari, this is your 11th script. Just sit there and just record the dang thing already. <laughs> I just... Oh gosh, the amount of time that has uh also oh, um I did turn up your volume just a little bit so people can hear you a little bit better. But yes, I the... turned up my volume as well. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crystal clear. Yes. I don't know, the amount of times we have sat in calls just like going over things like that. Cause you don't just do that too. As you said earlier, sometimes you can be like really good emotional support. Cause uh, you know, listen, something that some people may not realize is that when you become a content creator, no one will ever tell you how lonely it is like being a content creator because everyone is too busy trying to balance their work in home life or maintain their friendships and also work on their own content. And like the really nice thing about having like a manager, especially for like Tessa in particular, is that there are just some things that I just can't talk to anybody about because no one really is around me in my content. And it's just really nice to like have someone to bounce ideas off of and someone who's just not gonna like sit there and judge me for coming up with an idea that may or may not like be a good one. And like, they'll, she'll sit down and like actually be like, okay, let's see if this is actually a good idea for your brand. And like, does this make sense? Should you focus on this? And it is nice to have someone to talk to for that. I mean, so I think, so I think, um, sorry, trying to process what i'm trying to say before i talk but like i think one thing that is actually like um interesting about all that is like feedback is really like actually like constructive detailed feedback is actually really hard to come by in the wild because it's like when you're trying to ask a lot of people it's not anyone's fault i i just want to make that very clear um when you're trying to actually get constructive detailed helpful feedback about how to improve the quality of your content um what's going to help make you grow and all that a lot of people will respond with do what makes you happy um and that or like hey just do what you want um have fun that's all good and dandy and that does help with like confidence and self-esteem but it doesn't actually help with like specific direction um and it's like trying to get more than that is is a difficult thing and that that does lead to stuff like analysis process it leads to burnout it leads to just feeling kind of lost and then throwing crap at the wall and seeing what sticks and that can take a long long time and um yes it's not anyone's long. fault part <laughs> it's not anyone's fault particularly this stuff is difficult because you don't want, exactly want to offend the person that you are a fan of and you don't want to um, go too hard to the point where you are seen as like backseating um, a person's career or something. And so trying to be a confidant to someone is very difficult when like someone needs like a harsh truth, for example. I've had different people who've come to me and try to give me like the impossible right oh they we've done that with me too to... though right i think well no not not quite no you have a very concrete motive 
that and drive that you naturally have and you have a mm. genuine passion for this stuff but i've worked with a lot of different people who just actually don't have a drive for this stuff and they're doing this because they feel like there's nothing else they can do in life and they're just kind of lost as people and they want to basically hit uh hit stream go live get famous get rich and that is really difficult to do not everyone can actually do that because there's a talent aspect of this like you you do have to be a little bit talented if you want to like just be yourself and just kind of like go out and stream and all of that and it, it can work it works for plenty of people um but like any occupation just because one occupation comes your way and you can do it it doesn't exactly mean it's for you right now or probably ever and that usually comes down to like me being able to break down like okay what do you want to do and it's like a lot of i don't knows and i i and then they start admitting this this is just science it's not like a a clear role or anything it's kind of sad it's just like i'll get down to people just admitting just straight up that they don't like streaming and they don't like their communities and it's like okay that explains a lot why you didn't want to ask them about feedback or anything or you didn't want to you know take any kind of interest in what they want to see or like what they're more receptive to and it's it's kind of sad and there's just a lot of a lot of stuff going on with that and it's like it's really sad and so like i i do have to give that harsh truth to people sometimes of like hey i think you needed to step to take a step back from streaming come back later and sometimes that actually helps people a lot to you know see with clarity exactly what it is they want to do other times it doesn't work and they they go on and do other jobs like um, complete medical school one person did like they they were basically dropping out of medical school to do vtubing and I was just like, you actually like being a nurse, so why not do that? And it was because they they just, they, they were burned out of doing medical school and they wanted to do something fun for a while. And I'm like, oh. cool, you're, you're doing this as a hobby, that, that's great. But they're like, I don't actually like doing this though. And I'm like, ah. It's it's wild. And so like if I'm looking at other kind of ideas I with 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 clients like you Murray who have a lot of drive, a lot of ambition, a lot of like really clear vision, it can kind of come to a point where it's like we have a lot of potential options, a lot of potential pro projects to do, but we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money to do everything. And so we narrow down based on a strategy that we had already set out of like hey we're trying to do um, lifestyle and vlogging and just more focused on you. Um, we, you like doing your, your education. We, you like mm -hmm. doing your, um, your lifestyle and vlogs. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we have a, we have a specific strategy and yeah. how to get there. We, we start to figure out clearly, okay, we have all of these potential things to do. What falls in line with that? And what can we kind of smudge a little bit to, to see how we can experiment or just see what makes you happy? Yeah. And we, we take those ri those calculated risks. And if something doesn't work and you actually didn't like it, we could at least say we tried. But at the end of the day, we, we start to see our patterns and what actually makes you happy. And um, mm. you, you, you have seen yourself come around to enjoying uh, a very specific way of doing things and you you seem to have a much livelier aspect you seem to have much more energy going into things and that's that's a good thing for me i i want that for you yeah that yeah you know actually you bring up a couple of good points here um so to say one of them is, that I think is kind of interesting is how you said that um, I am a lot more lively. And like, you know, I think part of that is because you are one of those types of people who can give like that hard truth. So um, something that I think a lot of people don't realize is that, oh, I know this is going to be like kind of hard to believe, but a lot of people's managers tend to be their significant other. I have noticed this amongst a lot of creators, not all of them, but I have noticed a lot of content creators and managers are their significant other. So imagine having to be that person who has to give that hard truth saying, I don't think content creation is for you. And that is your significant other. Do you know like how much that would like just 
hurt because then you have that yeah, bias. Absolutely. It's it's such a um, precarious situation oftentimes and you have what's called a conflict of interest oftentimes, but if you can tow that line and you have a good enough relationship and trust with your partner, you can make it work. Like there's a there's a couple that um, Vexoria and Zolan, they're a married couple that make it work because they have absolute trust in one another and they get a, they have the same sense of humor, they get along very well, their interests are aligned and they work very well together. And I'm sure just like any other couple, they have their spats and disagreements, but they seem to have a healthy enough relationship to make it work for this long. And yeah. Zolan, and he ended up starting to work at MSM Talent as a talent manager while maintaining his, his role with, with Effexoria. And I do the same thing with my own girlfriend, Yumiko. Um, we, we butt heads a lot and we both have very strong opinions about things, but we have a very healthy relationship. We have a lot of trust in one another and we do toe that line and we have to find ways that make, make things work. And one of those things actually was like, um, instead of talking, doing meetings in, in, in the same room in person, we actually found that you know, just talking on Discord with one another in different rooms actually was the thing that made it much more smoother and more productive. And all of a sudden, it's just this weird change of environment that works, like, psychologically, that just somehow makes that balance that much easier. And mm. a lot of times for a lot of these other smaller creators with their significant others, it's often because that's the person they can trust the most. And if the partner's willing to do all that kind of work, then they're willing to make those, make sacrifices in their lives to prioritize another uh, person's career like that. Mm. And it, it can get a lot of, there's a lot of potential benefits to it, but there's also a lot of risks because yes. if, if the relationship starts to strain, then the person you were staking your career on can really make a dent on, on your mental health and everything. It's, it's a very tough situation and risk to, to take. And I even wish I had more people I could talk to, to have that exact kind of camaraderie with. Like I can just talk to other couples who are in the same situation because it, it feels lonely. There's not a lot of uh, couples who are in that exact situation. Yeah. Um, no, that makes sense. It, it comes it, with its own challenges. It's like that whole, you know, that saying that goes like, don't mix business and pleasure kind of thing. Like I, I see like, I see both sides of it because of that. And, you know, that's why I think there's this, like, confusion about what is it that managers actually do or that they don't know what they're doing. And if you really think about everything that, like, you know, that you've said, Tessa, I think it makes sense why there is this misconception that, you know, managers are just like snake oil salesmen who just take your money and don't actually give you help or if they do they give you a bunch of like generic advice that you could just find off of like google or like youtube like i see that all the time and i think it's because i i do i do too yeah i mean continue. yeah oh no no you're you're fine i was just saying i i think it's because of like what you just said like again some of them are your significant others are they actually like do they have background in management or are they just kind of like your assistant that's just kind of helping you like put things together and, and like reaching out to things are they actually helping you with your emails or are they just there for moral support the fact that tessa can do all of these things and not every manager does all that stuff like when you hire a manager you should not expect them to do all that for you you should be very clear about what it is you need a manager for and i think because of the spectrum of what you can have with a manager people just don't know what to do with you guys they're like you know what what to hire you for they don't know what to ask what what to, how to utilize um like your expertise right and i think you have a, a precarious situation like have you ever seen the show kitchen nightmares yes so one very common theme in that show and why you have those nightmares in kitchens is because you have a lot of couples who want to get into this kind of stuff and they want to start these businesses and 
that is a quote unquote dream of theirs and it just turned out to be one of the partner's dreams and the other partner is just passively supporting and they end up having to sacrifice a hell of a lot and take on a, sh a hell of a lot of stress to make that happen and it often puts a lot of strains because the expectations don't meet reality and a lot of those couples do strain a lot of them end up separated and it's a very common story in america and that often happens in the whole family business aspect of things and there's really not like unless you have a very healthy relationship you have established boundaries you have good communication you are able to forgive your partner for and not sweat the small stuff that's a very big thing for couples to understand is don't sweat the small stuff. Otherwise, you're going to get hung up over bullshit. Oh, there I go again. Over bull, bull uh, over nonsense. <laughs> no, um, no, you're okay. I totally get what you mean. <laughs> the reason why I, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about this is because that, I believe, is probably one of like the biggest misconceptions people have about managers especially talent managers because okay let's say you know you don't want to have that strain with your significant other so you go out and you try to find a talent manager one mm -hmm. like <laughs> when you finally find someone to manage to manage you right you know mm -hmm. i have seen so many different content creators that are not just vtubers talk about how like their manager didn't really like help them they felt like you know they're spending all this money to get like generic advice or they're being creepy towards them and i feel and like right and and not only that but like i've also seen um like smaller creators go up to bigger creators and say hey can i hire you to be my manager you know like when i first started growing as a vtuber i had a lot of people ask me hey could you manage me like could you help me set out like you know and, and this is how they would frame it they go hey mari i need help with something i said okay what's up and they go um i was wondering if you could give me some feedback on like a model uh, outfit or a concept that i i'm interested in i'm like um sure i can take a look because to me that doesn't that's not like managing or consulting i'm just like they're asking like for advice on a reference like their concept and i look and i'll talk to them i'll give them a little bit of advice on it and then they'll start asking me more questions about like you know, what do you think I should stream? How do you think I should do this? Should I change my logo? What do you think about my logo? What do you think about my name? Like, what do you think about this? And, and I'm like, I'm not qualified to tell you how to like start your career. And then I see like bigger creators start like trying to become like a manager because they have all these smaller creators kind of like bringing this on to them. Because again, we don't know how to find managers. So instead, what's the best person to ask is our big content creator. And then people will charge all this money for advice that, well, to be quite frank, we just kind of like are barely scratching the surface and barely understand ourselves. Like I'm not qualified to give people managing advice. The advice that I would give someone is not going to really help them. It's going to be the generic stuff I say in my YouTube videos, which by the way, they're not generic. I'm sorry, but if you can't do the basics of what it is for this as like a job, then getting tailored advice is not going to help you you still have to do the basics as generic as it sounds and i think like that might be like a another like a second controversy is that you're spending all this money for what exactly like how do you know this person is not only qualified but isn't going to like take advantage of you like i'm constantly seeing snake oil snake oil like how can you tell if this person's going to like take advantage of you or not so if usually people have like a reputation, right? And um, when it comes to strictly their management capabilities, usually you'll want to look for like portfolios, um, credentials and um, uh, testimonials or just asking through the grapevine and word of mouth. And so if people have personal experience with a person, you're usually able to find it pretty easily. Um, and if you're able to find that you, whether determining if they're actually going to do the job or not, or whether or not they're going to do any other, um, things in general, it's a very difficult situation because the honest answer is you, you can't know until you'd make that risk. Um, like I see you scrolling through my Twitter and a lot of times I'm either retweeting like 
um, tips, advice, resources, or other accomplishments I've done with other clients. Um, and like, I'll, I'll help people get to be guests at conventions. I'll help, um, do all sorts of things, debuts, especially announcements and other kind of, uh, project reveals and stuff. And so retweeting those kind of things are things that I, I, I take a lot of pride in. Um, as for like how people talk about me with my management stuff, I, I, I don't actively advertise a lot of my stuff because I, I'm more focused on actually just sitting down and working every single day. And then people just kind of naturally talk about me one way or another. And if you were to tell everyone how you figured out about me and what made you bite the bullet, what, what would that look like? You know, that that's interesting that you bring this up because, um, what's it called? Uh, it's kind of an interesting story actually. So, I have always wanted to get a manager and like I know a lot of content creators probably thinking to themselves well do I actually need a manager what if this is just my hobby do I really need one what if this is my career do I really need one and you know hopefully like how I share my experiences with what made me decide to get a manager can kind of help answer those questions because the answer is no you don't need to have a manager it really just kind of depends on what it is that you need help with for me in particular i have adhd and in particular of that i have adhd type c which is combination why am i bringing this up because a lot of people like to just assume that adhd is one thing where you're just as happy bubbly hyperactive blah 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 doesn't shut up talking and that that's not true at all there is an inattentive side of adhd and then there's something even worse when you have both. How can you be hyperactive and inattentive at the same time? Well, hi, hello, I'm Mari. So, you know, that happens. And what is, why, why does that relate to me having a manager? Because I get off track. I get off track all the time. I want to do a stream where we play Minecraft or something. And it takes me 45 minutes just to start the game because I'm getting off track from stuff. If I want to make a video, it takes me sometimes weeks just to complete a single video because it's so difficult for me to sit down like actually sit down in my seat i have a stand-up desk now to kind of help with that a little bit when i get like jittery but even still it takes a lot of time and not having someone to really hold me accountable is what makes me struggle to get content out on a consistent basis not only that keeping up with dms of people i'm terrible at that anyone who ever sends me a message you can expect a response from me within three to five business days um then just trying to reach out to artists i have commissioned so many people who i still haven't received product from in years because i just forgot and let's be honest artists are terrible at updating like their commission works like i am an artist i can i can say this but we are and so i'm bad at remembering to follow up with them like that is my own fault i'm also bad at just remembering certain dates for collabs and then it'll be the day of the collab and like hey mari you ready to do this i'm like oh yeah totally and then i'm like trying to get everything together right in like 10 minutes so i need a manager to hold me accountable and to really follow up on these projects, like helping me just sitting, just having someone sit down with me and not necessarily holding my hand, but it, they call it like the buddy system. You have someone there to sit with you to kind of like keep you on track. And that is why I wanted to have a manager. I also wanted to have someone to bounce my ideas off of that's not like a family member or like, um, you know, uh what's it called if let's say like if i were to have like significant other be my manager like i wouldn't want to like put all this pressure onto that person and especially if like they're not a content creator and and even like i don't even like i don't even talk to my mom about this kind of stuff she doesn't even understand what vtubing is so it's like i don't have anyone to just sit there and say hey i have this idea for a video and i i need to know like how do i go about this I don't have anyone to talk about that with. I have other content creator friends that I have tried talking about this stuff. And you know, the types of responses that I get from people is that I don't think that's a good idea. I don't like, I don't see your vision. I don't think this is good. Like, I don't really understand. I don't know how to help. And that's something that I am kind of like tired of hearing. I'm tired of people not being able to see my vision, the things that I have, or 
I'm also tired of people just flat out like making digs at me because I do things in an unorthodox way. So I went to go get a manager, someone who's like professional and actually can look at things from multiple different perspectives. And one of the reasons why I discovered Tessa in particular was because of a tweet that had gone super viral, which was about the microphones. I don't, I don't, we don't have to talk about that, but like that's actually how I, I found you. With <laughs> TLDR. Okay, I can actually explain that one. It, it's been a both a blessing. That situation was both a blessing I'm and so a curse. I'm so sorry to um, call you out. <laughs> for a curse, I got harassed for like a month, but like it's okay. I recovered. But like um, the TLDR is I was with a client and I was having a pretty bad mental health day. And I am neurodivergent as well. And they had the worst audio I had ever heard. Like they were in a very open environment with their family. It was really a really low quality Samson microphone. And their family was screaming at each other, walking in and out of the room and slamming doors and just straight up screaming at each other, banging pots and pans and the, the client yelling at the family. And I'm just like, I started melting down. I got overstimulated melting down um, i was tipped over the edge on that and i just went to twitter because i had no impulse control for that very one moment i it just takes one moment sometimes to just not have control sometimes and you just go and for the most part i'm good at this stuff like pretty like these days i've, I've been a lot better about these kind of things but like just this one day in in a in a very uh nice January 2022 day, uh, 2023 day. And it just did not work out for me that day. And I went on this rant. Uh, I was accused of grifting through um, putting out Amazon affiliate links when uh, that was actually debunked. And I was just trying to be helpful, but at the same time, it was an, it was an, it was an autistic meltdown and thank you for saying that because i was just i just i didn't know if you were comfortable with saying that like sometimes no, people don't okay. realize it's, we're neurodivergent it's okay. like <laughs> and, the overstimulation is overstimulation it's it's really hard to control sometimes like yeah when you see like kids who it, there's this concept called masking versus not masking yes and masking is being able to like keep your cool and suppress a lot of the more autistic traits and it's like um i had to learn that through therapy actually and so um being able to do that it has its limits sometimes and for kids oftentimes you hear them kind of like kicking and screaming covering their ears because they're overstimulated they're they're in pain they're crying and that's why they're like they're they're having meltdowns in public that happens to adults it, it it really does and you know sometimes taking a nap is the thing that helps yeah and for me, i i went out and ranted because i didn't want to experience that again it was it was lack of impulse control in that one one evening and um i don't know like it, it's like it happened and no no it, it, it did is what it is and as a result i've met so many friends as a result of that met so many amazing people and despite being dragged by unexpected amounts of people um it gave it, it gave me opportunities to meet a lot of people hi and... like me like me yeah yeah like me like now me you like can me continue your story yeah I'm, I'm, I'm okay you don't have to feel bad for me um uh, but it that that was the gist of that situation but that's the thing though like i have definitely had um so i don't have autism but i have adhd and um because i'm very high functioning um i still have adhd episodes surprisingly i do and i've definitely had my fair share of like public meltdowns like not even just on twitter just in public and it's very embarrassing when it happens and i feel bad for people who are around me who have to experience it oh my god it's so funny because that's exactly <laughs> what pippa pippa of all people dm'd me out of the blue for that exact situation she's like you're, you're not wrong and don't you shouldn't be being dragged for this i understand what you're going through and i'm like wait what i love pippa she's so <laughs> she funny <laughs> she, she she followed me and i'm just sitting here like okay um 
what the fuck is going on? And I start making more and more friends like that. And here I am now. You're um, so right, though, because, like, <laughs> yes, that is how I saw you. But here's the thing. I didn't, like, just say, oh, I just saw you having, like, an autistic meltdown. I was like, yep, that's my manager right there. No, like, I, I saw what you wrote. And I did not, personally, when I had read that, I didn't think you were being condescending. I didn't think you were trying to be all high and mighty, looking down upon us poor people or something like that. I didn't think that at all. Or anything that everyone has said, I did not think that. I thought to myself when I had read that, I was like, wow, you know what? I remember back in the day when I first started off with my, um, my Blue Yeti. And I remember how much I would hate, like, you could hear everything in, like, the room. You could hear my dog barking. You could, like, hear anytime I, like, I don't know, rubbed my nose or something or, like, swallowed, you could hear it. And it it all comes down to just not setting your microphone correctly and not setting your stream room set up. And, like, you know, having a proper microphone is really essential. Not saying that Blue Yeti is not a good microphone. You can very much make a Blue Yeti sound amazing. Yeah. In hindsight, like for me, I've actually had a lot of, I've recommended to a lot of clients to actually use a Blue Yeti yeah. very specifically for ASMR. Yeah. It, it has enough sensitivity to actually make ASMR work with the, with the binaural audio channel setting. And in hindsight for me, like one of the reasons why I was specifically targeting USB microphones was because I have a lot of clients who aren't good at cable management. And so a lot of their USBs end up, they're, they're cheaply made. And so with not delicate care, they do get ruined over time and that can cause static interference. I'm also very sensitive to sound. And so I can hear that it does, it drains me, it bothers me. And so like, um, things have really progressed. Did you know that they have sh shoestrings for the cables these days? They do, they do because of that. And like, it's still, it's still, it's a valid reason for that to like upset you. And it's, it's a little annoying, but I think we're all aware that like the internet doesn't really care. They'll paint a narrative on you and kind of ride with it until they die. But like when I saw this and I saw like your stuff, I thought I was like, wow, this is actually really good advice. Who is this person? And so I took a look at your profile and I was like, oh, they do like managing stuff, huh? That's weird. Why don't I why don't I follow this person and keep an eye on them? And I think I like kept an eye on you for an entire year. I, an entire year, I just kind of watched you. <laughs> I do this to a lot of people. I just I just watched you. Just and every time like you would tweet something, you would always give that's amazing advice. Alley, that's alley cat behavior. I hope you know that. And just slowly inching in for the their new homeowners to give them food. And then they eventually just move in. I mean, you know, anyone who needs to pay their taxes in the coffee shop, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's coming up pretty soon. And anyways, you're right. You're absolutely right. But yes, I kept an eye and I was like, hmm, you know, in the back of my head, I always knew like, oh, it'd be really nice to have a manager. But I, at that time in my life, I couldn't justify hiring like a manager because again, I was just like everyone else. I thought, well, what is it that they really do? Why would I spend all this money um, not knowing like, what i'm gonna have them do i have like this weird thing where i want to have a lot of control with my content and something that i really don't like especially when it comes to, like hiring a video editor is that i don't like not having control over my stuff and i know that's probably like weird but there is an art to how i make my content and i want to have control over that and so having a manager i was ha i had the misunderstanding that, oh, if I have a manager, they're going to control everything I say and do, tell me what I can and can't do. I mean, I've seen plenty of big VTubers who have PR statements literally written for them where it literally says, insert this here, and they forgot to take it out. Like, I just, I don't want that to be me. I don't want to spend all this money and, like, be controlled. Hi, today we're going to be talking about this prob problematic person, Lorem Ipsum. <laughs> yeah, Lorem Ipsum. <laughs> That sussy person. Yeah, sussy baka. No, and that, and, but like, okay. Okay, so let me answer the question. What made me bite the bullet to like actually say, you know what? No, I need a manager. I not only need a manager, but I want Tessa as my manager because I have looked at other managers. I have, I've, I have definitely been watching for a couple of years now, um, lots of people. And what I particularly liked about Tessa's work is that Every time, every like person you have worked with, I have seen the change. I have seen like the glow ups that 
everyone has when they have worked with you which tells which told me that wow she must actually be like providing some kind of perspective on them because this person used to be like this and now they have like a completely different aura about them i'm not saying like you make you're making people not be themselves but it's like they have some new understanding about content and how to carry themselves accordingly and i was like wow that's actually very interesting not only that but you've been listed on certain projects that um whenever you see like the credits pop up on screen i would see your name and i was like wow she was a part of this that's very interesting okay all right and plus the advice that you give one of the biggest like mis controversies i see people when it comes to like having bad v to be managing experiences is that they're paying all this money to get generic advice but that quote unquote generic advice i see you just tweeting out for free i've seen like your live streams you just flat out talk about it, and i was like okay so she's just giving this stuff away for free what is it that i'm actually paying for well at that point in my life i was at probably like the lowest point in my life not to get too personal about it but i was not doing good i was not in a good like mental like headspace during that time and i kind of like looked at myself what is it that i want what career do i want to do what do i want to do in life i want to be a vtuber i want to be a youtuber and i when i realized that i said okay what's preventing me from doing this i don't like i i don't have any direction i don't have any light i don't have any guidance like i said earlier the things that i struggle with what's the investment i'm gonna have to make to do with this and i said i need to actually have someone manage me so that's when i decided to send you a message to see what is it that I'm actually paying for? And what is it that you can do? And I can't remember the first message I sent you. I'm pretty sure it was like a really long and weird and like venti, like novel. I don't, it was weird. And somehow you just took it all and you're just like, ah, okay, Mari, here's a head pat. Here's a cookie for you. Go get some chalky milk. Let's have a chat. That's kind of where it went. I mean, pretty much. And... I, I get that a lot, actually. Um, and whenever I complete a debut and I'm I actually list myself as a I don't always list myself because, you know, details get lost sometimes because um, debuts are really stressful, really mm -hmm. stressful. So it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy to to miss some details. So like with when I am credited, like, for example, another client, Eden, um, that was a really big debut and that was something she was planning for like two years and I came in about like nine months to go and basically a lot of things were stalled and I just kind of got in immediately you know laid everything out revved the engines and we we got everything done and you mentioned it earlier about how like a lot of artists are not able to manage their time effectively, thus not being able to communicate very effectively. And so a lot of what I do is I make sure, as a project manager, I make sure that stuff gets done on time. And sometimes I, I falter a little bit. Um, everyone does with their job, but um, I do make sure to make up for lost time and update timelines and make sure that it's all gonna be on time. And if there are delays that it's not that bad of a delay i try to make sure that everyone is able to be on the same page when it comes to debuts but with like you for example i make sure that you're actually doing things that you're actually passionate about that you're actually going to be fully into because like if you're playing rage shadow legends i don't think anyone on your channel is going to want to watch it i like i'm going to be completely honest and, ah. and as as lucrative as a lot of those mobile games can be, it's or a lot of those mobile games can be, it's it's often not exactly productive unless it's like a big trend and meme, kind of like uh, Nick. What is how do you spell it? Nicky. Ni yeah, Nicky. Yeah, yeah. You Nikkei, know, it's kind of funny um, you bring that up because like I, mobile game sponsors are very like hard to work with and like that's why i often don't take them is because they're they're too stressful um they, they really are and but that's like a conversation for another day but you're right like nikki had such a good like meme especially with the um vtube assets that came out with that as well and the fact that the whole game is made out of live 2d and i just think that's such a fascinating concept for a mobile game but still like it's like what you said there's so much that goes into this and like you know um 
you're not the only person I have reached out to for like to talk about on this episode because you know you're what's a since you're my, my manager or one of like my uh like my managers um you were able to have time to come sit here and talk with me but I have reached out to other like VTuber managers to get like their perspective and their insights on what is they do in their day-to-day -day job because even though like I know it's annoying that I keep going back to this question but what is it that a manager does what are the benefits that you get from a manager and um i i have like a i did like a little short questionnaire for some other managers that i reached out to not everyone was able to get back to me because you guys are very busy like managers are very busy they're they're doing stuff but we i um i did get a couple of responses from some people that i kind of wanted to just uh kind of like gloss not really gloss but kind of like review just a little bit because i feel like you know, Tessa does, Tessa listed everything else that she has done for me and for other clients and stuff, but there's other types of managers that people can hire. And one of the people that I, I had respond to me is um, specifically like how you had mentioned earlier, an agent, where they specifically help manage emails, inbounds and outbounds. They do their best to like vet people, get rid of scams. And yes, I have been given so many scams, so many scams that like, my agents at vroots help vet for me and they straight up like and the, you know what the best part about having the the vro boys is that i never have to check my emails ever i never have to stress about my emails because they do it for me and anytime something that's not a scam is something that they believe i would be interested in they say hey mari let's have a talk i just got like an email that i think would be interesting to you and so like this person here also does that they're an agent so they help with the negotiations between clients and making sure talents are getting paid what they deserve. That is the biggest thing that so many content creators have to struggle with is that they're getting underpaid, undercut because companies take advantage of them because they realize you don't have a manager. So they think you're easy pickings. They make you do all this work for just pennies. And like, you know, they might offer you like $500 and you think, oh my God, that's so much money. I've never made that. You could be getting thousands of dollars if you had a manager or an agent to negotiate that for you. You need to know your worth. You don't know your worth. And that's why like agents and managers can help you with that kind of stuff because I didn't know my worth. The amount of times I realized how much I was underpaid in the past before I had an agent or a manager made me angry, flat out. It made me angry because I didn't realize I could negotiate the things that I can now. And I'm not even that big of a creator. So if you put it into like perspective on like a spectrum of like your value, even if you only have 10 viewers, do you realize how valuable your 10 viewers are? They're a lot more valuable than a company is gonna make them out to be. And that's why having an agent to help show your worth, like, hey, they might only have 10 viewers, but guess what? Each one of those 10 viewers is spending like 20 to like $100 on them per like month. Do you know, like that's very monetizable. That's conversions. Your your audience is worth so much more money. Like like in, in the sense of like, they will buy products. And so you deserve to be paid more for that. That's something that an agent can help you with and help negotiate for you. You don't have to stress about any of that. You don't need to like sit there and say why you're worth the money. They do that for you. And they back it up with your numbers and your analytics that they take the time to go through and you don't have to stress about it. Another thing, um, uh, another manager had responded when I asked them, what do you do as a manager? Is uh, I love this person so much. <laughs> if they know who they know who they are, um, but this particular person is very different than what I have ever seen a manager do. Even with like Tessa, for example, this particular person does more on assistance duties rather than content management and planning. Like in particular, they do a lot of communications from sponsorships to general public outreach or. Um, any type of communications before it gets to the talent, this person vets all of that. Imagine having to talk to so many different people and then you present that to the talent after you've already like kind of scrubbed through it all. Then something else that they do is connecting people um, if there's not already a pre-established connection, just like you said, like networking. Um, occasionally, you know, during sponsorships, they talk about how they keep in contact with the staff um, in case if like their talent's not able to respond. Um, and interestingly enough, this actually makes this person go to like, let's say it's like a convention and there's like a sponsor type of convention uh, for the talent. Sometimes like this person will go to the convention for the talent 
because of like being like i guess like the middleman so to say i'm not sure if that's the right word but being able to be that person who goes there directly to make sure everything is secured for the talent like literally flying yourself to a convention to make sure the person has a place to stay in a hotel uh, the panels are actually going to be there. They're not just doing this last minute. Like being that person to go there and make sure things are happening. So that way when your talent arrives, they're not stressed and confused and like, um, uh, like not sure where to go and what's happening. So yeah, they're kind of like as a stand-in. Yeah, a perfect example is a stand-in. Um, what the, another thing that this person does for their talent is guest preparation during events um they handle all the different multitudes of people like doing interviews for different shows um ease the tensions that some of these other people might have and assist them like if you have someone like for example if i if it wasn't tessa if i had like a bunch of people on my show tessa would be the one like easing the other creators being like hey what are we anxious about okay let's try to like get us all hyped up on the same energy and stuff like he, the fact that this person goes out of the way and does that holy cow that's a lot and um the last thing that this person does is video editing yes this is a manager who also video edits so they take the talent's content they edit it they tell the story they make they take care of everything everything in the sense of like from the conceptualizing of the, uh, the of the concept all the way to the video being published and then they'll go and publish the video help them with tags thumbnails titles all of it and that is something that um i don't see a lot of managers do because you can only put so many skill points in different areas of expertise and like personally if this were me i that's I, i'd be spreading myself way too thin trying to do all of that that's why i i have tessa to help me and i ha i'm trying to find like video editors to work with so i can ease out of that and start focusing more on art because it's hard to handle the networking handle the events you know um talking to all these people and then streaming and then having to edit and then do art and like it's a lot so the fact that like this person does all of this for their talent is phenomenal granted they only have one talent that they manage and i think that's why they're able to do all of that but still i find that like it's very interesting how you have like such a spectrum of what it is that you can do mm -hmm. that was like a really long thing but i, was, I just no, find it interesting it's, it's, a, it's a really good good set of points and i just wanted to add by saying like while this person does do video editing i i do have a few other examples in in mind i'm not going to name names but like um they they definitely do that is that is a thing that happens and it's not exactly normal but it's not a bad normal by any means. But if you do happen to have that kind of trifecta of talent, it they're a keeper for sure. Yeah. Um, it, you just have to make sure like you're communicating because like it's a two way street. While while talent managers can uh, and you you are paying them like they're also kind of like business partners, not officially like on paper, but they are they're invested in your career. Yes. And. And you're all their their reputation is closely tied to your career because you're it's a two way street of risk where you're handing your career over to them and they're handing their career over to you and vice versa. And it's it's a situation of really high stakes trust. And a lot of people there are examples of people who take full advantage of that, thinking that it's not going it, to it, nothing's going to happen to them. But that they they and we'll we'll get to that um but it's it's definitely like it's it's difficult to kind of talk about that kind of stuff in public because oftentimes you are confronting with like ndas you're also confronting um trying to toe the line between yeah the the privacy of your clients but also with um because, like, for example, like, while it is public data, some clients might not be as comfortable with you talking about their their projects in totality, you know, because that is something that they don't want spotlight on. And, True. Yeah. Um, it's it's not always a, an available option. And, like, if I were to um, join, like, a, a talent management agency, like... Um, 
let's say MSM or Mythic Talent, I do have to give those portfolios. But before I even do that, I have to ask every single client permission explicitly. And if there is a no in that, I have to respect that and leave them out when giving my portfolio. And oftentimes, I'm often so busy with handling projects that it just does, I don't have the time usually to put out um, portfolios yet. I should. I should have a website and all that that's, you know, nice and professional, but I'm more focused on building connections and doing all that. And um, I wanted to, you know, circle back to chat real quick because there are some really important questions that I want to dissolve. And one thing uh, that I that I did see as not exactly a red flag, but it's also just like hold, pump the brakes a bit because like if you're like really, really small, like underneath, a, like, uh, I would say like 35 CCV at the very least, like you're really getting started often to, unless you're like looking for like debut management and you're looking, you have a lot of resources at hand to really go big or go home kind of deal. Unless like if you're just like starting from scratch and you have like no resources at all and you're trying to work with a manager, I personally always kind of tell a lot of people that it's not worth the time on both ends because if you're trying to prior, you have to prioritize your needs. And while everything we're talking about is a really good thing for them, because like about 95% of people never make it to affiliate. That's, that's just kind of a statistical fact. If you look at places like Solinome, Twitch Tracker, um, marketing research reports uh, concerning Twitch streaming and the creator economy for economic reports, you're going to see oftentimes that 95 to 98 percent of people never make it to Twitch partner, let alone make it past affiliate. And 99 percent of people don't get much further than just getting that that partnership and and getting rejected and then kind of burning out and spiraling out and so like trying to prioritize your needs like i would definitely say like managers aren't exactly at the bottom they're kind of like middle of the road because like i would say like you know make sure all your bills are covered and you have so a sound financial plan going in and then if you had discretionary budget after that you know after doing all of your commissions and having a discre like a discretionary budget for that take a look at video editors I always recommend that to people either way. And if you're, um, there's a lot of advice online that says like, oh, everyone needs to get on TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels. It's, you know, that's funny. That's it, so funny because didn't you and I have a conversation about how that's not necessary for me? And we've proved no, it's it. it's not. <laughs> it's not because, and I've had other clients like, like Yumi who, we we spent so much time putting into shorts and it just didn't really pan out for one reason or, or another and that's just kind of the the way the cookie crumbles for some brands and some people's humor and time and place like some people are just not meant for shorts and instead you should put your efforts into something like long form content on youtube and um trying to put in some time towards like managing your community on discord um there's other avenues to build up a community and if you want more than anything i think most vtubers would need a vtuber assistant a, a specifically like an administrative assistant like mario was talking about earlier because the major the majority of the time there's a lot of resources that are not utilized with with talent management specifically and so it like assume you have a video editor right you're getting a lot of those needs point out you already have that brand aware like some sort of brand awareness strategy happening that needs to happen one way or another where you could use a talent manager is then going in after you have enough money to spare for our talent manager to step in and be like, okay, so I see this approach that you've got. Let's take a look at the content and let's analyze the content. Let's analyze your VODs. Let's analyze your, your, your YouTube videos. Let's take a look at the back. Let's, let's take a look under the hood and then determine like, okay, 
here's what's going wrong. Okay, let's take a look at what the editor does. Okay, I'm gonna have a talk with the editor. Okay, let's try this. Okay, this is working or it's not working. Okay, if it's not working, here's what we can do. And you're starting to have problem solving and critical thinking and brainstorming together. And creating those kind of solutions does help accelerate that growth a bit. And it doesn't always happen all the time because it can always come down to your own audience. And, yeah. and, but also another hard truth, it could also come down to you and your own, like, I, I hate to be kind of a dick, but skill issue, bro. No, like, that makes um, sense. Like sometimes because talent is a skill set, Ta- you yeah, know, you, but... like improving, um, acting and being able to, um, have enough social etiquette and skills. Like when you're on collabs, okay knowing your collab etiquette and knowing all these kind of things, networking on your own end and then having a manager then supplement and help you ex- really accelerate that. And it's like, it's a, it takes two to tango with that kind of thing. You're, you're right. It's just like sometimes, cause I know sometimes people, a lot of people who will probably hear that would think, well, maybe I'm not talented. Maybe I'm not this and not that. And maybe, or maybe the problem is that it's not that you're not talented is that you don't know what your talents are and sometimes having a manager can help show you what those talents bingo. are bingo and um because they're that but here's the thing i have met people who have zero talents believe it or not they're like they have zero talents is that like but an atypical I, issue <laughs> is, is that an anomaly no, it's a it's not an anomaly it happens more often than you think i would say it's not exactly the norm but it happens enough that it's not an anomaly it's uncommon but um when i do see those people a talent to me is not something you're born with it's a set of skills that you spend time working on and um when I see people like that, I I take a look at, okay, what are your possible interests? Because there's got to be something you're interested in, at the very least, hobby or just something you've always wanted to do. Okay, so what if it turned out to be watercolor canvas painting? Okay, cool. Um, and this is like another one of my clients who I consulted, not managed, managed um, with, with consultations basically like how I do them. It's kind of like a touch and go kind of thing. Like we, you pay like a shorter fee. Um, we we meet periodically, and I, I I do a lot of those assessments and strategizing with you, and then meet like periodically, two weeks, one month, three months, depends. But one of them, her name is Fairy Sammy, and they have a lot of talent as an artist. And so I was one day just like. What, so you are very talented as an artist, Sammy. And what if you were to, we were just kind of like, like joking around. And I was like, what if you were to actually use your painting skills and turn and life 2D skills and we combined it together? She's like, I've never thought of that. And I'm like, let's try it out and see what happens. And it, it's been helping her grow like crazy ever since. And she, she turned herself into a Rococo painting. A, a, That's a, an so oil cool. Painting. Okay, okay. It is really cool. And so <laughs> she made all sorts of toggles and it's really goofy and it's literally herself. She oil painted herself and then rigged it. So I like that. So that, like you said, like that's a more uncommon issue. I saw that, um, I saw that, uh, Yumiko and Cha, hi Yumi. I was asking, you know, because earlier, like you mentioned, that's like an uncommon thing. What happens if you, have you ever had a client that has, come up to you and had a problem where you don't really know how to answer it or you just don't know how I to explain how you it pre- you, you you premise it with yumi <laughs> i know where you're going with this because that is her <laughs> <laughs> i have a lot of frustrations <laughs> with with um with working with that and it's not like i have frustrations with her it's just that Every, it's okay, Tessa. Times, you can admit it. It's all right. It's all, <laughs> there's a lot of times I will mess up and I will hit a wall. She'll hit a wall, and she's not the only one. But that is where the anomaly does happen because it does come down to audience. She is insanely talented, Yumi. But the problem is, is she doesn't have. It's an audience mismatch. She has a lot of, like a lot of the creepy simps. Over over the time that I've oh my favorite like I love I love creepy men. 
<laughs> she, she, she has a lot of like really creep of, creepy people who are not like quite there and it's like they there's more time that would have to be spent to like help them get to a better place but at, in the meantime they are just really making things awkward like they'll like people will be in chat will be having a really good conversation then they pop in with something insanely creepy breaking their community guidelines and there's no mods available and suddenly we just have like a whole situation where it's like oh would you look at that chat died and it may or may not come back alive for the next 30 minutes and all of a sudden we have a serious dip in engagement then that happens enough time over time people are just like you know what screw this i'm gonna go somewhere else and watch someone else whose community is actually there, who's actually talkative, yada, yada, yada. And you have this kind of cycle where you have to deal with these kind of situations with these individuals that make up the community. And then you have to actually like look into the community management side of things. And so like, that's actually a question that, so like, not only do I get a lot of aspiring managers messaging me, but I also get people who are active managers who message me, especially for these exact complicated situations because these are the kind of situations that are very difficult and challenging and you have to think outside of the box and sometimes you're not even going to come up with an answer and you have to just try everything possible and you keep trying and trying and through, through sheer resilience you might break through someday and our current answer for her is like okay what if we just debuted what if we just had an official debut finally like you've got like 55 average viewers and suddenly you know we're not quite at partner push level you had gallbladder surgery and so i don't know if that took a hit or not but you know what let's just get you all get everyone all revved up and we see what happens and maybe that will get her close to partner numbers and then we'll shift gears into a partner push and through that we really get her to partner and beyond because life doesn't end at partner and there's there's just really difficult liminal stages with VTubing at so many different ends because like when you're like 10 like 10 15 concurrent viewers or below you are considered like seriously small to like there's a, a derogative term called two view and a lot of those people are very disregarded but there's also a very tight-knit hype community that only sticks to those exact people oh but my they... god that makes so much more sense i remember i remember when i got like more than i think 10 viewers and i remember getting a weird dm one day of someone being like you know i you've changed i was like what do you mean i've changed like you know ever since you've gotten big you've just been different and i'm like what and they'll what? be defining quote unquote big as like oh i have 25 concurrent viewers now and newsflash you're still small you still got a long ways to go and for me my definition of small doesn't even get past towards like 125 ccv 100. but some know, people take like, offense to that though they're like well they do. well why do you call me small but the thing is being small is not a bad thing it's not a bad it's thing still because, real people you know, there's there, there's common trends it's like you're not making quite enough income to really like you know do a lot more than you want to do there's and that's not a total rule it's just like a very common thing or and there's different liminal stages like once you get past that small vtuber like capital s small vtuber side of things and you go beyond you start get losing that support and then you start to try to find new grounds with new friends and if you happen to find people and and who you vibe with you can ride coast and you can coast through a bit if you have the right community then you get to partner in which case you start getting less people supporting you and so once you're on your partner or they you, get you jealous and partner. angry and then they start talking yeah. about you and like it, it's yeah, hard and and you have to have like a tug of war with all that and so you're still having a lot more hills to climb from 75 onward and so once you get past like 125 concurrent viewers and you start having massive peaks of like 500 plus concurrent viewers that's when 
gates start opening up and the the those who give clouts will start giving you clout they'll start giving you attention some of the bigger indies or um being able to collab with different companies and, and having like brand sponsors deals. yeah you know but I, those are they tend to they they tend to be very small dollar and they're yeah. not like the biggest brand deals and so Calling them quote unquote big isn't exactly accurate because they still have a lot of struggles. It's just different stages of different struggles. And then once you actually get past that 150 kind of mark and you're going well into the like the 250s, 500s, that's when you start to get a lot more traction. You start to uh, like you still have your struggles. Don't get me wrong, but it's like things aren't as difficult as they were before. There, that is certainly yeah. true. No, no, you're right. But you and still have different struggles of scaling. I think this whole concept of like struggles is very fascinating. And like, I I appreciate you for sharing like how you deal with like struggling situations because I think a lot of people don't realize, um, everything that Tessa had just said. Now, imagine like you know you're paying this person all this money. Okay, you're paying this person all this money to help manage you, and everything they suggested to you is not working like you and 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 when i say this i mean you're actually taking their advice and doing what they said like if i if tessa told me to do something i just don't do it then like i can't just sit there and get mad at her being like well you're not helping me because i didn't do what she said but let's say i did let's say she suggested like a bunch of things to me and i and i'm doing it and nothing is working i would start getting frustrated i would start like questioning myself being like okay why am i spending all this money not seeing any results it starts to make you wonder is this like, is Tessa actually like helping me? Is this actually like, is this a good investment? And so I reached out to those other um, managers because I talked to them about this as well. Um, particularly like I asked them when you fall short on things for whatever reasons come up, like how do you make it up to clients when things are not going um, how they're supposed to go? And one of them had said to me was that, you know, they, they pretty much sit down, have a talk with the talent and say, hey, we explain the situation we understand um and we hope that you can also understand um you know particularly when it comes to like this uh talent agent um they said like for example if they aren't getting new sponsorships like nothing that they have reached out to other companies that have gotten back to them they're just not able to really get you like something that you might find worthwhile um in particular and they have agreed they have said it's okay for me to disclose this i'm not breaking nda by saying this um they said that in their contracts they added clauses that they send out for this specific type of thing for extraneous circumstances because life happens sometimes and sometimes like as tessa had mentioned earlier sometimes like you just don't have it and companies don't want to invest in you because you haven't reached whatever like threshold it is that they're looking for and sometimes that makes it really hard to go full-time because you're not getting that monetary like stability to be able to be a full-time content creator and that's very frustrating it's very frustrating to have someone that you're working with for months like maybe even like a whole year and you haven't gotten like a single sponsor and so they have a particular clause that says, hey, like, if you feel like this isn't really working out or we feel like we just we can't find anything for you, um, then it's OK to part ways. The other person who had responded to this um, had said in their response, they said, first and foremost, I would immediately communicate when I'm unable to do something. This lets this person delegate it to someone else if it's urgent. But to be quite frank, this hasn't really happened. Um, I think the closest situation of this in a regular scenario is me not being knowledgeable about something. But those subjects were not expected of me in the first place. Still, if I notably struggle with a concept, I try to make time to learn more about it. Let's say, for example, um, let's say, for example, I asked Tessa for advice on um, what's something that's kind of obscure about how to make better Animal Crossing content. I don't know if Tessa has actually played Animal Crossing or knows much about it or the niche or the community of Animal Crossing and like what makes it successful content. So maybe she doesn't have a lot of knowledge about it. So what does she have to do? She has to now go research the community for Animal Crossing and start really thinking, okay, 
what makes this content so good for people? Why do people watch this? Is this actually something suitable for Mari? Does this make sense with her brand, her personality? What is her twist that I can help her with? Things like that is kind of what this person was talking about. At least that's how I'm interpreting it. Um, they also had said, most of the time when we have a disagreement, we usually talk it out. And this is fascinating. It's okay to disagree with your manager. I like, I know it's one thing to not take their advice, but you can very much just disagree, you know, and then talk it out. And they said the manager talent relationship may be there, but fundamentally we are friends. Nothing a good apology and some communication can't fix. Um, perhaps things are like this because of me, because, you know, because they are friends and that makes it a little bit easier for them uh, to communicate and like kind of talk things out. But the last thing they said was, um, they could see themselves if for whatever reason, if this had like a lot of money at stake where you're being hired to, you know, help this person's career grow. And for whatever reason, that's just not happening. Then um, what they would probably suggest is finding like a replacement, like a manager who can actually like they would. This person literally said they would go out of their way to find a manager who is more skilled and more suitable to help their client and literally like set them up with that manager. And if you're paying someone all this money, you are literally taking a pay cut to help your client go find some. And I can't believe this person said that in that response. That is, that's, that is amazing. Holy cow. Thank you so much for sharing that in this little response. Um, I appreciate you for sharing that because I don't think many managers would even, would ever like actually do that or even think about doing that. Not like there's anything wrong with it, but that really surprised me to, to read that. And so Tessa, for you, for example, how would you answer like this type of question whenever you would fall short? How would you make it up to like, like for me, for example, if there, for whatever reason you couldn't, um, I, I don't know like what the term would be like falling short. Like, so yeah. for me, when, when I find myself falling short, um, I usually try to like, like they were saying, I usually try to have a conversation. I usually try to actually critically analyze the situation and be like, okay, what's working? What's not? Okay. Why is this not working? Okay. So what are the pain points that this person's enduring? So is it like, okay, so they're having trouble having consistency due to a life, extraneous circumstances, like a life issue. Okay, um, I understand that. Sometimes I'm much more flexible with my payments if, if there is an issue. And like, for example, like if I messed up on something, like if I had to reschedule due to extraneous circumstances, my health, but you know, th there was only like one time that we could have met. Like I have another client right now who's going to like, uh, uh, going to different uh, places and they have other kind of personal things going on. And I only have one meeting in the month with them. I will adjust my prices for the next month for that kind of individual. So that way that I am making up for that lost time. And so I will also kind of accommodate by being like, okay, since we can't meet, I'm not only going to give you that, 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 cut for that extra month like a I'm discount on the to, on the stuff like, yeah like like a discount and so like i'll be like okay so on top of that give me a list of things you want me to work on and i'll update the my notion to to reflect that and i'll schedule out time uh, admin time for myself to to work on that basically kind of like backup backlog homework and i'll i'll kind of get on that and even though we're not specifically meeting, those meeting times are very valuable. I understand that. And it's like talking over text doesn't always clearly convey emotion. It doesn't convey importance as well. True. And so that's why I have those meetings. Uh, and so um, I have my own way of accommodating people and every manager is going to be different. Some don't even do it and some are very confident in their skills to do it and kudos to them um and perhaps they have a team i have my own assistant i i used to have two um that one parted ways because they had financial needs and so i gave them a recommendation to an agency and that was a direct connection i had and i went ahead and recommended them and and here we are now I have yeah. trained a new assistant who helps me offload a lot of tasks so I can then refocus my efforts on other clients. And so 
that's another accommodation that I do is I hire help when I need it. And so um, having a manager and assistant combo is invaluable. And so that is also a kind of difficult thing because when you're starting out, you can usually, you can't really afford a traditional agent or manager model of like taking a 15, 10, uh, 10 to 25% revenue cut because you're not making any kind of money. And so having like a volunteer manager of, sh of sorts often is kind of the only thing you can do and hopes and dreams and promises. And that often is a big red flag kind of situation. And so when people do take that, it's very difficult to find a good situation out of that. And it definitely happens where it is good, but oftentimes it, it doesn't work out and a lot of resentment happens. And so- Oh yeah, that sucks. And so for, for the most part, like that, that 15, 25% of total revenue could be a massive hit. Yeah, it's not. It, That's it's a lot of money. Complex. Like, I don't think people realize like this, like people, <laughs> they they think that like, yeah, it's, oh God, it's so frustrating when you think about how much money is at stake, even if it's like a hundred dollars, that is a lot of money for some people, you know, like, especially if you live right, paycheck and, to paycheck. Right. Cause like, if you're making like, um, let me just give like an average, like I, I see a lot of clients make about like a thousand dollars off of like, like I try to get clients to also diversify their income. So let's just say they're making some on Patreon, some on YouTube ad AdSense, some on Twitch payouts, and then some on like, uh, other kind of tips they get. And the total is, is 1000. So like 10% of course is going to be a hundred and then. 15% on the lower end is 150. And so let's also get like 25%. That is going to be a uh, 250. And a, a manager kind of has to like evaluate, okay, how much work am I willing to do for a solid month for $250? That's below minimum wage. Yeah. Yeah. And that's for one and client, right? That is for a single client. And so if you multiply that by about four clients, that's about $1,000. That's still kind of a side hustle. That's still a lot of work too. It's a lot of work and it's kind of a side hustle. And so trying to get those logistics all worked out, it's, it's difficult because you, as a manager, trying to start up managing in general, you have to kind of evaluate where your needs are because like, and evaluate what your clientele is. And when you're starting out, you don't, you're in a very beggars can't be choosers situation. But when you do get to manage bigger people somehow, that they're not just dealing with like a thousand dollars. Like sometimes it's like 5,000 here, a thousand there. You can handle those lower income clients and still take that 15% cut. And so it's, it's a very difficult position to be in and trying to rely solely on, on management it's it's a difficult job and for me i had no choice i was in a difficult position myself in life and um i graduated college at the height of covid 19. right and no one was hiring nobody was hiring anyone who was who got like a marketing degree i got a digital marketing degree at arizona state university i'm okay with doxing myself a little bit for that i got an associates in communications in 2017 and trying to and i also had an internship i did content creation before i did podcasting before i did blogging before it's it's really difficult because like you can have those skill sets but you know I'm not going to go into the whole weeds of like trying to get a job outside, like with like company companies, especially with doing marketing. It's really, comp it's highly competitive. And oftentimes you're dealing with like internal hires versus just trying to gather your information in their corporate databases. And so you're just kind of wasting a lot of time and, you know, a thousand plus applications in, I gave up and I had to make my own job. No, that and makes sense. I I'm, I, I became a talent manager because I had to. Um, I really started getting going. Um, I want to say Black Friday 2022, even though I had uh, a lot of other clients touch and go. But I really started going with with the management side of things rather than consultation side of things in black on Black Friday 
2022. Real quick, can and you explain what uh what the difference is between just doing consultations versus management? Because I have pe- I've have seen yeah, managers sure, who sure. don't actually manage and they just do consultations. Can you just explain that? Right. So the difference is like I we've talked extensively about management. You know that is a lot of other duties, usually including like basically being on call, data analyst and content reviewer. And also like a uh, project manager um, doing agent work if you sign up for that if uh, and emotional support. And that's really like all hands on deck and you're you're responding when you can and you're kind of on call. Um, and agent work is more focused on the um, the the brand and brand deals and the partnerships and and contracts and oftentimes you're gonna work with lawyers to create those things those templates in the first place and then you handle contracts from there and negotiations um as for consultations those are um offers for basically sitting people down one to one uh, and giving like reviewing their VODs, reviewing their content, much like you would with manager, but it's not on call. It's very like, hey, you're scheduled for this time. Like, let's say someone were to um, you book me right now for a consultation. I would then be like, okay, here's my, here's some information I need you to fill out. Here's a worksheet I'm gonna have you work on. Okay, once you're done with that, when's when's the availability okay let's schedule a month out okay we we sit down we do a brand review and then we tie it up with the marketing strategy and from there that's about two hours of consultation and then after that whole onboarding process then a follow-up happens typically typically where you will have a follow-up like about two weeks or a month after that just so that you can collect a lot of data to analyze later to see if whatever strategy you were doing is working or not and then um you then pivot if you need to or you then move on to the next steps it's like okay now that this is working here's what you can do from here and that's again very touch and go and that is the effective difference i think what is really sad for me because I've been waiting, uh, I, I kind of forgot to respond to the whole, um, a lot of managers don't know what they're talking about. And there's been times where I will consult different male VTubers, right? And there's like some oh common Oh God, not males. Who... I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some, there's, there's, there's some people who give those generic advices and they're not actually helpful then they'll come to me because they they were asking around they're like oh you came highly recommended that is a very common response i get and so they'll come to me give me all that i'll go through the whole onboarding process and i'll be i'll usually ask the questions of okay so you said you came to me because another person didn't work out what did they tell you so that i can be caught up to speed and one of them said one time they're like oh the person who i was i was working with last time just told me to be like Shoto. And I'm like, my what? dude, you have the what personality do you, What do you mean by that? What? They're, yeah, so it's like be, be an e-boy, be kind of more personable and funny. And I'm like, my dude, you have the personality of a senile grandpa. I'm sorry, my guy. But like, you are so mellow, so chill. In fact, you should be like the... the um, lo-fi synth boy on on youtube like oh my god that would actually be pog okay can we get that though i hope he did that i really hope he did that like i hope he's like you know know, what i'm gonna unshow to you and become this old man (laughs) (laughs) i literally that's kind of what i did with it all like what if you actually unironically went full grandpa core and you were like grandpa core I was like, what if you just kind of went like lo-fi kind of approach? You had the headphones on and you had the messy hair and the s- he 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 talks a little bit like this and he's oh, like, okay, oh, guys, he talks hi, a little bit hi, like hi, that. Everyone. Oh, he's got that yeah, kind of voice. Hi, hi. Oh, hello oh. everyone. I hope you're having a good stream today. It's a very and good stream. I'm like, I'm Grandpa like, Core. How, how are you gonna take that personality and be like, yeah, just be like Shoto? It's not gonna work out. The personalities do not match, and so. Oh, gee, too, bro. <laughs> no, and like uh, I totally agree with you because, like, you know, and and here's the thing. Again, 
sometimes, you know, you do try and try and try and nothing works. But like, I think that's very different than someone flat out just being like, yeah, you should just be like this popular creator because they're popular. It doesn't work. And see, often, like I've had a lot of um, disagreements with a lot of people over this. And it's, it's a very common notion. And it's also why people do come to you to try to get advice. It's like um, a lot of people are like, oh, I can be popular if I just do exactly what this bigger VTuber has done. Then they proceed to try to do that and they fail and come up short. And it's often because <sighs> they don't have the personality. They don't have the talent. They, they, they specialize in other things. They're good at other things. They have a different personality that they're masking over and i'm gonna be honest that's then... how i feel when people copy me and i like look at their stuff and i'm just like the stuff that i do doesn't match you why are you cop like no. it makes me wonder who, to it's who because... told you what manager told you to copy me well it's oftentimes <laughs> not even a manager it's just kind of like a popular belief it's like okay this person is a case study they they obviously succeeded so therefore there is merit to it and to an extent that is true but it's like you have to discern who you are versus who you feel like you want to be versus like who you actually can be and then doubling down on that and that's that's a personal philosophy thing for me but there there's there's different schools of thoughts among managers and this is actually something that it really isn't noticed or talked about but that that is a fact some people really are like hey do whatever's popular double down on that and really go hard at it and sometimes you will actually make it uh, most of the time you're not but you know if you can actually really strike that you can you can make it and that is a certain philosophy of growth and it can happen and to an extent is kind of it does have its validity but i don't believe in that i i personally believe in the more authentic approach where you are being unironically yourself and you're having your branding more revolved around yourself and if you have content that you actually believe in, actually love, then you're going to do a lot better because you are not going to get burned out as much. You're actually going to see rewards for it typically. You know what? And that's, exact, that's exactly why I try to do what it is I do. You know what? I'm just going to say it. You know, I'm just going to say it. I copy people. I copy people all the time. Except Grandma the difference. And, 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 no. <laughs> no. There is a difference when I copy people. I do the, I do the, oh God, I can't steal Ludwig's line where he says yoink and twist. I was going to say stroke and then I was like, no way, let's not say that on YouTube. <laughs> so That's I, the VTuber way, of course, you know. I inspire when I see something that I really want to like, but I don't copy a one for one. I do take like my own twist. And there are times where I've come to you saying, hey, I like what this person's doing. What can I do? Like, let's talk about what I can do to like not copy this one for one. But what can I like, you know, inspire from this? Because I like what's going on here and I think this could fit me. You know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's a little bit different. Chat's just like, yeah. yeah, no, grandma, it's time for your medicine and go to bed. No, but for real, like, okay, it's, I, th I think we can all agree that managing is not what it seems. And it's very hard. Like a lot of managers are kind of the behind the scenes that really can um, enhance someone's career as it should. But, you know, there's not a lot of light that gets shined, which makes me wonder, Tessa, why did you become a manager? I know you said that it's because you had no choice, but why like managing for like VTubers? Like, do you enjoy doing this? Cause you, you literally with your skills, you could very much have joined like an agency and like become a talent for like some well, other right company. Out, right out of the gate, I didn't have uh, the necessary experience because I was fresh out of college. Even though I had an internship, I had all this other thing. It's not exactly the talent manager um, skill set. And also back then in 2020, there just wasn't any kind of infrastructure available to accept assistant jobs. And so I literally was on my own. And so I had to do what I had to do to make this kind of stuff work. And so one of the reasons why I do what I do is because before all this, I, I used to do anime podcasting, I used to do blogging, and I used to go to conventions. I've been watching anime my entire life. And so with VTubers, it's like, oh, you're all anime people and you have a, a fan base that enjoys 
this kind of real time slice of life con content and I'm just like, oh my God, this is a fu this is amazing. And I want to be a part of this. And it turns out I'm, I, I excel at this kind of stuff and I actually feel fulfilled doing this. And now that um, I'm doing what I do so much, I kind of became content with this and this is what I actually focus on rather than any kind of like drama or or anything else. I'm I'm very oh dedicated god. to Oh god, I started part. choking you said drama. Um, oh god. <laughs> oh god. Well, it's just like you could easily involve yourself with stuff, but it take it, you know, having restraint is difficult and building that over time is difficult. And so I just kind of bury myself in my job and I I have my 7-hour days, uh, 5 days a week. Um, and I, I bury my head into the work and I, I love this job so much and I, I wouldn't know what else to do other than, than talent management and VTubers is kind of the best of all worlds with, with this and I really believe in the possibilities. And I love that! One of the things I actually always wanted to do was, um, make sure that people understood that they could do more than just, um what's it called just gaming content and i don't mind gaming content at all like they're so it's so fun but god i feel like I, we're gonna have so I many do... hot takes written about us because because <laughs> you and i both I have do... a certain opinion about <laughs> gaming content i think that's why we vibe really well together we both have very strong opinions about it but that's a conversation right. for another day <laughs> it is it is and so that's 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 a big thing that drives me is I I do like finding those kind of people that want that dare to do a lot more things and there's a there's an account I respect called Shindags who reveal oh, I who, love Shin. Who often, <laughs> yeah, Shin, he often highlights a lot of those kind of people who are willing to go above and beyond and um that further inspires me day to day but I often like working with that. No, I can totally understand. You know, I think that's kind of funny because um the other managers I reached out to there, when I had asked them, why do you manage VTubers? Like, like, uh, why? Like, why? And one of them straight up said, like, oh, you know, it was kind of an accident. Like, they didn't necessarily say they got isekai into being a manager, but, like, that, that's <laughs> kind of what happened. Like, basically, uh, they're really good friends with a person who, um, you know, is a very, very successful creator. Um... And I guess this person had reached out to them as a friend saying, hey, would you like to help me with this? And um, yeah, he started off as like being his assistant and kind of like um, just really like being like that supporter and really helping to get other stuff that's stressful for content creations out. And people would constantly make a joke saying, oh, that's his producer, which I mean, you know, managing and producing are two very different jobs, but they can definitely blend into each other for sure. But I just thought that was like, you know, after that exchange and him like, you know, doing more managing slash producing slash editing, like all that stuff. He eventually was just kind of like, hey, you know what? While I'm finishing school and stuff and like with my other job, why don't I just like actually invest into like this person's career? Not only is this like my best friend, but like I really believe in like what he does and not only do I admire him, but just being able to be part of that like team and being able to really help things go along is what made him want to become a manager. And I really, really resonate with that because even though I don't do managing, I do production and the ba I have worked with some very famous streamers. I won't tell you which uh, which ones they are, but I've definitely worked in like conventions where I am the person who controls the stream. So everything that you see up on stream, I'm the one that controls that. I'm the one who makes sure that you're getting all the best shots that you're seeing from the gameplay. And when it's time to cut to the music, I'm making sure that is happening. I am the one that's delegating every little element which is a very stressful job but i love doing it and i love doing it specifically because those famous streamers who which by the way i never even get to talk to i see them walk up on stage and i'm like oh yeah i'm making this person's entire like livelihood right now happening on uh on twitch this in youtube this is kind of interesting i could screw everything up right now if i really want i and not like i would do that anyways i would never i would never do that but I am part of the production. I am the behind the scenes, the faceless, the maskless, the one that wears, you know, all black because you have to during production. I'm the one that's the unknown and that you don't care about me, you don't think about me, but I'm the one of the core pieces that puts the entire 
content together. And streamers and content creators and companies and studios rely on me and my team to make these projects come to life. And there's something very fulfilling at seeing all the hard work that you and your team puts together to make this content come to life. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing to see like, wow, I helped make this happen. And so the fact that this person who does this managing for their friend, I really, really resonate with you on like this connection and this passion to really want to have this other person become successful. Because in a way, you can kind of vicariously live a little bit of that um, success. And I think that's just very fascinating because, you know, some of these people, they won't ever think about you and stuff when you when they hire production teams. They don't normally like think about that stuff. But it's still a very fulfilling experience. And I get to see a lot of things behind the scenes. I get to see how streamers are off stream. And I think that's kind of cool. I also get to see like um, the different technical difficulties that happen and how we have to stream tech to solve that to make sure things are not stressful and going smoothly it's just a very like fun job as stressful as it is um the other person who i had reached out to that answered literally said something that i love so much and it's part of the biggest reason why i make a lot of my advice commentary videos and it's because they said <laughs> they said i got dragged into this but but they were kidding they said in all seriousness i started become an, a talent agent because I wanted to help small content, smaller content creators navigate the somewhat predatory side of content creation when it comes to sponsorships. And I do enjoy it, especially when I call clients on their bluffs and tell them to stop lowballing talents, which I am so thankful for, because like I said earlier, a lot of us don't know what we're worth. And it's so refreshing to have somebody actually stick up for us because when you're a content creator, it's a very lonely journey and it can feel like you're alone and just sometimes having like at least someone on your side whether that be a manager an agent or a friend um can really make or break the difference of the success of your career because a lot of it is mental if you don't have a strong positive like outlook on your career it's going to be very difficult for you to grow because you're not going to want to do it anymore and if you don't want to do it anymore then you're not going to do it anymore. So yeah, I think that in terms of, you know, management, we've been hyping it up. We've talked a little bit about like the red flags and stuff. I want to get a little bit more into that. If I was completely, you know, we never met and whatever, and I wanted to go find a manager, how could I go out and do that like what are the red flags that i need to look at besides looking at their portfolio like let's say i take a bet on someone how when will i know eventually like okay this is not working like how long do you know oh that is a really good question because um i have to actually oh my god that is a really good question because i also have to um ask those exact same questions especially when i'm trying to find new assistants like um like, I am on the lookout for a new assistant, and I have some people in mind. Um, but when I go out and look out for current VTuber managers and potential VTuber assistants, um, trying to actually look for those people is really difficult. There is a manager server, but there there are limitations with trying to figure out those internal things. And... It's kind of the, the risk of hiring labor in general. Like, just because they are really good on paper, it doesn't necessarily translate to either A, them actually doing the job in the first place for whatever reason, or B, them being a good fit for you. And there's been times with my current assistant where um, I tried to have him help me with certain clients and I immediately found um, compatibility issues. And I was like, okay, I need to assess seriously what their strong suits are. Like you, you actually made a really good point, Mario, of like managers do have to have like kind of like skill points that they have to invest in. Like having a jack of all trades just isn't realistic. Like for me, Project management is one thing I invest a lot in, but also it's a lot of the creativity. Yes, yes, that's like, my favorite thing about you. Yes, literally, like, not to cut you off, it's just, 
out of all the, if I could only pick one thing I would pay a sh buttload of money for, it's going to be the creativity. Specifically because, um, having, if I am stuck, if I am like literally stuck, like, like for example, right before we were about to start this uh, podcast, I literally, right before the call, I was telling Tessa, like, I'm really nervous. I don't know how to start this. I don't even know what to tweet. Like, I'm literally panicking right now. She's like, hold on one second. Within like, one minute she typed up a little tweet blurb she's like here here's a template make this into your own words and then i changed it to like m how i would say it but that that right there here, copy my homework but don't do it <laughs> yeah that's exactly it that's exactly what it was yeah yeah <laughs> that's kind of what it's like and it's like um I'm trying to find a lot of assistants who are able to do a lot of the same thing. And it's really hard because you you do have to, like for me, I have to train people to, to get to that. And there's a lot of people who want to shadow me. And trying to find time to just sit down and do that, that is actually really difficult because I'm... I'm trying to focus on my current job right now, but I also have the needs to expand. And the logistics of doing that actually are really difficult. And it's to the point where I'm I'm actually feeling like I am my own one person agency and trying to expand that out starts to actually build those foundations and it's hard. Does it make it's you really like regret hard. it sometimes because of that? Cause I saw someone asking like- Yeah, do I regret being a manager? And the short answer is no longer answer is, um, I didn't know that I would be a manager growing up. I didn't know, like you never really know, like you, you may have an idea of what you want to do like when you're in college, in high school, but you never really, really know where life takes you. And so for me, I, I don't regret being a manager ever. In fact, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it took me a while to realize that. And when I went my when I met my girlfriend, Yumi, she has helped me change as a person like overnight. And r me actually caring about someone has given me a lot of drive to really value that. And building this business from the ground up has been really difficult, but it, because it comes really naturally for me, um, it's work that I love and appreciate. And so there is zero regret taking this path. And there's times where I, I do even get offers to, you know, join a company. But then I, I, it's hard. It's really hard, you know, making the decision between, okay, do I stay with my talents now or do I, you know, join a different company and I'm always I'm always it's always such a difficult position but I usually lean towards well I have all these amazing people that I work with I have a lot of projects I'm really looking forward to I have zero regrets doing exactly what I'm doing and I value loyalty a lot with um with the people I work with and so I want to see things through I want to see them get to where they need to go and if I myself have to improve to to get there then so be it. And there was a time just this year that I felt an existential crisis where I felt like I was inadequate, that I didn't have enough connections. And that is another reason why there's supposedly a lot of bad managers is because there's a lot of people trying to get into this industry very fresh, but they don't have a lot of connections. And there is one very interesting selling point that I do see a lot of managers have where they say they have a lot of industry connections, but they don't it's such a very strong promise without a lot of follow through and it's not anyone's fault it's just like hey this is my homie who is an artist and that is that's good especially if you can negotiate like hey here's a friends and family's discount that's actually really good that's, that's actually really, really nice wow hey hold on and so, so like, friends wanna, and family huh wanna, if you want to classify that as an industry connection, then you're not exactly incorrect. Because what is the, the net difference of someone who's barely starting out and a manager who's barely starting out, and they're able to provide you with a cheaper model than what's on the market? You know. like let's just say the market price of a, of a, of a decent quality model is about $2,000. $1,000 for art, $1,000 for rigging. 
and the friends and family discount gets you down to 750 750 right or like 500 500 so the total is that's a 50 percent discount for a full model that's actually really good you can then spend those that thousand dollars elsewhere like with uh, graphics you can get it with um, just other kind of assets uh, motion graphics and promotion that and then they can try to negotiate from there and build from the ground up um, so there is validity if you do give some people a chance um, but you then you then go back to the whole thing of like do you take that risk and I'm not those people I can't say whether or not you are taking a good risk or not. You have to, there, there is, like now with VGen, they, there is reviews and you can put up testimonials. And I do have my testimonials up on my VGen. And when I do have a website, I can also provide, uh, you know, when I do put that up, I'm also going to probably provide, okay, here's the statistics of, okay, here's the before scene, here's the after scene, here's how they grew. Um, here's how they, here, and I'll just have like a case study page per, per client who's willing, and it's like an advanced testimonial kind of thing. Like that is something that can help build trust. And maybe that's something I need to do to rise to the occasion to help with a lot of that broken trust over time. And one of the situations we were talking about that prompted all this in the first place was a manager named Evil Bunny. And the TLDR of that is she basically did a lot of the whole um, agent work. She was more of an agent and she, she didn't do a whole lot beyond agent work and whatever she did was very minimal at best and so when she did do some work people were happy for whatever they got but it came with a lot of delays and she started asking people for loans that's a massive red flag you want to talk about red flags you've got one really big one right there and typically you don't ask your clients for loans instead you figure your shit out and if you if you don't have the business acumen to be like okay i'm gonna pivot myself and maybe i need to have a quick sale and hire a temporary assistant to help me with the with the workload or i just kind of figure just figure something out to make ends meet or like I go have a side gig or I don't quit my day job and I, I do. No, VTuber literally, like don't quit your day job for this, guys. Like don't. Like especially I still work in mine, you know, like. <laughs> especially starting out because you have to understand like with inflation and everything, like trying to do this full time is is unsustainable. Yeah. It's, it's volatile. It's very volatile and trying to get to the point where you are living off of this full time with that full time income because most people have like a threshold of okay what is your ideal outcome for this what 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 do you need to actually go full time and a lot of people say about 2000 a month newsflash that's $24,000 you're you're in the federal poverty limit so trying to be like okay what if i actually made $36,000 well guess what that's still a lot of money per month and you're talking about trying to get uh payouts on twitch uh, payouts on YouTube, Patreon, and perhaps you do like OnlyFans or Fansly, and perhaps you even do more things like selling assets and you have a side hustle and trying to even scratch beyond the federal poverty limits with your with your yearly income. It's really difficult to justify. And so there's a lot of stress that comes with that. And so trying to find a manager and trying to find red flags there's not an easy answer, and yeah, that makes you do sense. have to you, you have to take those risks, and sometimes it isn't always going to work out. And usually, what I find with people, for me, who part ways, it's usually because of a financial situation and being able to afford a manager, whether or not I negotiate in a 10, 15, or 25 percent cut of revenue, or I negotiate in, okay, maybe I give you a discount for like X amount of months, and even then. It can be too much and people need to have their time to recover. And that's kind of the truth. As, as a manager, you're going to have a lot of people who come and go because life happens and you can't get mad at your, your talents and you can't talk bad behind their back. Because I've seen I've seen those kind of cases where managers are are not talking very well about their other clients and it's it's a lot of drama that's not necessary and it's like um 
You know, being able being able to um, try to identify red flags is is as simple as like you know it when you see it when you when you feel that gut instinct of like oh this is this something's off yeah there's a good chance that there that there's something off and yep. so like for for me at any given time I just ha- that's why for me for personally for me. And this is actually a debatable point um, amongst my peers about like how do you pay your structure, and in the manager discord that that I'm in, um, there is there was an active discussion about that, and it's not so clear cut as people think, um, because of that whole logistics I was talking about with handling smaller VTubers by and large. Because people, there if you have a project that you need help with, th- you should be able to hire help for it. Um, and it's not like if you're just like a quote unquote two viewer, perhaps you have a really big ambitious debut project idea and you so you so happen to have the means to pay for it, then you should be able to pay for that and have someone help you with the project. And if you're willing to put in that much money for whatever reason and whatever background you have, it, it's all case by case basis. And it's 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 complicated, but it's like, uh, this is probably probably going to be a great stream for me to link out to a lot of aspiring managers because yes, please it's like, do yeah because i was gonna say yeah. like what you just said is so right like yeah you're so right you know actually i have a quote for all of you i think you would like i think you in particular would like this i you definitely know this quote there's no way you don't um it's called the six degrees of separation and there's this notion of that um there are you you yourself as a person are about six people or fewer connect social connections away from where you want to be in life it's kind of like a friend of a friend kind of thing where sometimes you know you as this two viewer i guess whatever you know whatever like that's such a weird term but like you as a small little tiny streamer are just six connections away from becoming one of the biggest most successful streamers and sometimes finding a manager or an agent or having a consultant could very well be that first degree of separation because through them you can then be connected and meet other people Mm -hmm. and it's also just like it's it's so tricky because it's like um like i'm saying like not everyone has those connections that that are mentioned and it's like when you do figure out someone who does things do change and like but you won't know if you don't take the risk you know you have to talk to people Mm -hmm. because like with with like any because one of the things that is actually very controversial in in vtubing especially in the indie scene is understanding that you're actually an entrepreneur yes (laughs) why is that so hot what (laughs) <laughs> starting from nothing as an entrepreneur is really difficult you have no maidens <laughs> why no maidens, is that no such a hot take what do people really it's not because, know that well no it's 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 because it can suck out a lot of the fun and there's there's a truth to that and thinking of it as a hobby is is a good thing and i believe that a lot of people have trouble thinking of this as a business because they don't want to understand they they don't want to think about that too much and i don't blame them i i don't because if it works it works if it doesn't then you're just going to be stressing way more than you should over things you can't exactly control and a lot of it takes a lot of time so one of the things about having this as a um as a job kind of like its own job is understanding that you're not always going to have everything you need right away and so it's going to take time to get where you need to go and that applies to both vtubers themselves and managers and i saw something very early on it's like how do i get a manager after hearing like hey you should get a manager i just want to clarify I don't know if we're contradicting ourselves or not, but I, I want to make it very clear. If you're like starting out, I would not recommend a manager unless you have really big plans and you have the, the means to do it. And the capital because, and like know what you're doing. Yeah, because like if you have the mean that like the capital, which is the means to do it, then you have 
a lot of risk that you're willing to partake with. And a lot of your time is amongst all of that too. You're risking your time every single day and your mental health. And so at some point it can work, but it's not easy. It, it's not. And so if you have a growth mindset with this, where you're like, okay, things didn't work out today. What can I do better? What can I do something about yes. this? That always will be the best thing you can do, manager or not. And in my opinion, if you're starting out trying to see in the first place whether or not you need a manager, you don't need a manager if you just barely started streaming. You should probably figure out whether or not you like streaming at all. And maybe you like making videos instead. How, how would you know unless you tried it? It's always going to so be an I automatic no if you don't try. Like, And, and that's why, mm -hmm. you know... That's why I've been doing this for seven years and I just started working with Tessa like a couple of months ago. Seven years. And I just finally decided, okay, you know what? I think I want to have a manager. I, I, I have justified that the work that I have on my plate, I need to offload some of that. I need assistance. Like I need help. Like I need someone who can be just as creatively invested into my channel and like my content as i am and like that took a lot of self-discovery and i am one of those individuals the only thing i will ever ever praise myself for is that i do have a growth mindset i will like, take whatever criticism whatever like things that happen and i will try to think what is it that i can improve and it's a very different perspective on things like it's a very different mindset because it's, it's a difficult thing it's it really is difficult yeah because it's it's so easy to try to to try to be like oh nothing is going my way and the world hates me and my yeah, we've all been sucks. there. <laughs> all these people I'm trying to collab with, they they're gatekeepers. They're they hate this, me. That, and the other, and perhaps perhaps that's actually true. I'm not gonna discredit that. And perhaps it's true because black there are these social blacklisting where you know you look funny, you're you're weird. The people think you're weird. That shit happens. That that stuff happens. And yeah, tell me it's about it. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that, and it's really unfortunate. But. I guarantee that most of the time that's not the case, especially if you don't know anyone and you have literally like two views, you're not, you don't really have an audience to even talk to. And so there's often times like you just shut down during the stream and you're not really entertaining people. You're, you're just kind of sitting there quietly on stream because you aren't really, um, people aren't really invested enough to watch your streams quite yet. And there is a skill curve to this. And yes, it's, that's it's true. Difficult. And like, you know, I guess for one final follow up and stuff, we've talked a lot about like on the creator side, like, you know, should you get a manager and how's what's the way to go about it? But like, what about, you know, for the people who want to become a manager? Because it's really hard to find managers. I had to find you through a viral tweet, controversial or not. That's how I found you. But mm -hmm. when I remember when I tried looking for managers, it's hard to find because some people don't make themselves known to be a manager and like, you know, putting VTuber manager in your bio is like apparently cringe to some people so like if you are an aspiring manager what do you what should like do you have any advice for for those types of people on how to find clients like what can they do um so it's the current situation is actually really difficult because um right now it's 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 oftentimes like a lot of the good managers already work for a company, right? Yeah. Or they, they have an independent practice like I am and they're quite busy, no slots available. And then you're like, okay, what do I do now? And you can then try to search for something. Then you have that dilemma from before of like, is this worth the risk or not? We answered that in detail. But like um, trying to find managers right now is really difficult. And some of them are just bots just straight up bots and it's like um if you search for for like vtuber manager or talent manager or you go to um most of the time you're gonna you're gonna find outside of like just straight up searching it's gonna be through word of mouth most likely yeah so you gotta just, talk to people and ask you do have to talk to people but oftentimes that alone is really difficult and people are more likely than not just gonna ask a friend or their significant other and not only that people don't share really it difficult. 
Like no, they they don't share it, but and that really does come down to like um, advertising themselves and the lack of advertising themselves or lack of ability to pierce their own um, um, lack of following, if you will. So like yeah, um, yeah. And if you notice, a lot of CEOs and managers they they don't really have big big um, social media profiles and a lot of them like it that way because they're able to express their opinions or showcase different things to very specific people and if and that's just kind of what happens eventually in the social media space with with marketing space is a lot of people get really burned out a lot of professionals get really burned out from working with social media and they want to kind of resign to very specific people rather than a lot of people because I totally they get want it. to be able to be more specific with who they talk to. And, yeah. And their networks tend to be a lot smaller, but it's more specific and more concise. And yeah. So trying to find those people is just like finding any other connections with networking in general. It's real. It really does down to are you talking it's that you know six degree of separation kind of stuff that's social thing in a nutshell is like you have these web of connections and do you happen to know someone in your immediate bubble that actually knows someone who's willing to do a thing and if you're in luck with that then maybe they do providing that you ask a friend and they actually share with you. I remember when I first became a VTuber and I like asked a couple of other creators I thought I was cool with. I was like, so where did you find your manager? And they just like straight up did not want to tell me. Like they, it's as, as if they were afraid I was going to steal their manager when genuinely I was struggling. And I was like, I need direction. Like I'm asking that like is, for help. That is, yeah, that is another issue is like, Managers are very val good managers are very, very valuable resource because a good manager will be able to make a substantial difference in some sort of way that is worth a lot of money and time and emotional investment. And if you're willing to to actually go through with it and stick with stick by each other, the whole two way street thing then you've got yourself someone that you kind of want no one to see and and that often is very difficult i'm fortunate that i have a lot of clients who are kind of blabbermouths and they like talking about me because they're proud of me and i'm proud of personally them. i it, disagree with like trying to gatekeep your manager like that's my own personal take like i, I love not, talking about you i I'm love not, bringing you up I'm you know i'm not saying it's like uh in my opinion or, or anything it's an observation that mm -hmm. i have it's like um i it's like there is that natural fear that i can understand some people having where um it's it's kind of like um that feeling you have when you have like an indie band that you really really like and it kind of or like that show that no one real those hidden gems of like shows bands whatever that you really really like that you don't want anyone else to know about because it feels very personal to you and it, it's kind of like yours and it's it's something that you value very highly and if other people have have access to that hidden gem then it's not a hidden gem anymore yeah. and so and so um oftentimes it, it's difficult to say why a lot of managers don't a actively advertise themselves or you know go about a lot of things and there's it, i don't want to speculate too much but there is there is definitely like a pressure to not seem too clout chasey with a lot of this stuff because if you want to expand out your your business as a manager trying to find yourself in a position of like okay i have to take on more clients but i am feeling overworked and so i want to keep my workload down so i have a, a strong work-life balance and trying to maintain that is so difficult it is so so difficult and if you don't maintain that you're screwed you're, you're screwed you're gonna get burned out i got i've been burned out myself but i don't regret doing it uh, i don't regret being a manager if anything, what I do regret is not 
learning how to do work-life balance a lot better. And sometimes it was necessary to overwork myself and try to juggle a lot because of situations that I've had in the past. But it's not something I would actively recommend. It's, it's you know, you do what you got to do, but you have to do things within your means. You know, I think that's right. I think a lot of us can just kind of have that takeaway of work-life balance is so important it's it's probably one of the most important life lessons you can have even if you're not a content creator just being able to separate work from pleasure and having an actual time for yourself and perfect example there has been some times where tessa has told me hey i think you've been working a little too much when's the last time you've like had anything fun to do like just just checking up on me it's not like i don't even know how she figures this out about me like I, I don't know i don't know where or how she figures it out that i've been like you know doing that adhd hyper focus thing <laughs> but she's just like hey mari when's the last time you've done anything like fun in a while and i was like wow it has been a while she's like yeah you know you know i just want to remind you it's okay to take like a few hours off or something for the night, you know, go have some fun. Literally, sometimes she just won't even answer me because she doesn't want to like have me keep working. So she'll just ignore me to be like, yeah, I want Mari to go hang out and do something fun. Cause that's what I'll do. I'll eventually forget and be like, okay, I'm gonna do something else now. <laughs> there is a method, I I'm gonna admit, there is a method to the madness where um, you'll be responding and responding to me. And I'd be like, I actually have other things to do myself like on my day off and i could indulge in that but i would be breaking my own work-life balance and my girlfriend yumi does actually keep me accountable on that or tries to yeah and that's good and though I'm not, I'm not always the best with it but um i i try I, I i at least try and so i have to then be like okay if i have to do this you also have to do this because this is an objectively good thing for you to do it you is should, you should be able to have your scheduled days off because I do have clients and I have seen a lot of streamers be like, you know what? I'm going to stream every single day for like seven hours. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, as oh you were, I'll, I'll let you uh, finish. I'll let you finish. Oh, I'll let you finish. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you it's always a struggle you know because you want to you want you, you feel guilty because it's like if i take a day off from streaming then everyone's gonna move on and forget about me right there's there's always that kind of pressure and i don't blame you it, it it's it's always a struggle um but you have to be able to trust your audience to come back and you also don't own your audience that's also been a very controversial thing and it's also kind of a, a pitfall I see with a lot of creators is they they become very scared. And that's that's the motivation for that is fear of of losing relevancy, of of not having their, their audience come back if they take a break. And the thing is is like people have a good BS detector and they can tell when you're not feeling as good. And if you don't do that for yourself then you're going to lose people over time. And a lot of managers who try to enforce this, your clients aren't always going to listen. And it, it's it's kind of a struggle and you have to, that's another thing that is that is a really good hallmark of a manager is being willing to know when to say no, when to be assertive with your clients. And you can't always hold your client's hand. You have to be stern and tough with them sometimes. You have to give tough love sometimes. And you have to be willing to tell your client, it doesn't matter how big or small they are. You have to be willing to tell them like, hey, what you've been doing is not okay. Or be like, okay, well, how you've been treating yourself is not okay. Okay, or like, hey, I don't think this is actually a good idea from the get go. It's like you have to be willing to take a stance with with your with your clients and put your foot down. But you also have to be willing to listen. And there's a lot of quote unquote 
people who have been called quote unquote bad managers and that's that's the key contention is whether or not they listen because they'll often have this kind of top-down approach where they're prescribing a strategy prescribing a branding like the whole hey just be like shoto be like x popular vtuber and there's not enough listening going on there and that's that's just a critique and i am not here to tell people how to do their business but it is something I myself have to deal with when it comes to um, working with clients, with working with people who have degraded trust with managers over time. And that isn't a criticism on your character. If, if this does apply to anyone, it's not a critique on your character. It's just we have a job to do. We have people that we're trying to help we need to do the best that we can to help these people and i believe that through active listening you can you can you can best accomplish that and if you don't do that enough your clients are not going to feel as valued and they might not come back and i've seen different managers spiral out and not have the correct uh output that they want the ideal output for like having clients and maintaining their business. And I don't know, I like, I don't know, but I, I think that asking for feedback on how you can do better is always gonna be really, really important. And you're not perfect. You may be an expert on something, right? But even the biggest experts need to understand humility and understand, hey, I could be wrong about this. I, my way may not actually work. And if you do realize that, and you have the self-awareness to realize that, you have an opportunity to actually improve and better help your clients. And a lot of people, like if you're, if you're like, you know, like the evil bunny situation, they're not there to do their job. They're there for a potential get rich quick scheme. They're there to do a scam. And you are not the priority. You're an ATM. Mm. And, and a lot of streamers do actually see their, their audience in the same way. And Yeah, I wouldn't know anything about that, right, guys? Ugh, I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but there, there, are, there are VTubers who get called out for that kind of thing. And managers are no different. They're no... They're, they're not above doing a lot of those same pitfalls. And there's no such thing as a perfect manager as much as a lot of clients want to say that for me, that, the, that I'm doing an amazing job. I, I have my shortcomings. I'm, I, I can certainly improve on a lot of things. And I'm always growing. And my hope at the end of the day is that I'm able to... Like I have these these responsibilities, these duties that I I agree to. And my hope is that I'm at least doing the best I can to fulfill those things that were agreed upon by a, a contract that I wrote up. I'm contractually I'm contractually obliged to obligated to fulfill my duties. And I take that very seriously. And if I fall short, I fall short and I admit to my mistakes, I try to improve. And I accommodate as a result. And that's the best that I anyone could do. And it is a big investment. It's a big risk because uh, like hiring a manager, hiring an, an agent, doing anything and trying to part with a lot of your money consistently. It's it's a big ask. It's a big risk. And I think it's it's understated just how important a lot of it is because I see a lot of I've seen a lot of comments on Twitter of like, oh, why do you need a manager if all you have to do is just stream? Why do you need a manager if emailing is just so easy? Well, it's OK, not then do simple. it. Do it. People do <laughs> do and they do end up doing that. But they all come up short and it's it's putting on a lot of hats and it's not easy and if you have the means to delegate tasks to a manager or an agent or perhaps both like in Mari's case you are in a much more fortunate position than a lot of other people there having a manager is a lot that's the cold hard truth if 
if you're able to afford a manager, then you're doing a lot better financially than a lot of other people for whatever reason. And if you're willing to take that risk, then you're willing to take that risk. And that goes that that the same thing that you can say about any business in any industry. Doing business costs money. It's the cost of doing business. No, you're you're so right. I also noticed um I noticed that you have been giving so much valuable information that my Discord cannot handle how amazing your like your advice has been because I'm I'm noticing that your um you you know how like sometimes your microphone will do that weird thing where it's like you start cutting out. It's mm -hmm. starting to do that now and I I think it's because I think I think you're giving too much value right now that literally <laughs> you are being censored right now and I I I would love to have you continue talking but I genuinely I don't know if Discord's going to allow you to keep talking. <laughs> no, it's it's probably like an audio um driver issue but um I I if I missed out anything I'm willing to answer but um that well, that is the that's the clear cut thing at the end of the day it's a two way street it's a fluid process and there's risks on both ends and just being willing to listen as a manager being willing to grow and accept feedback ask for feedback and being willing to humble yourself is ultimately at the end of the day what's really necessary to grow and to actually do your job as a manager yeah yeah you're right i guess with that being said tessa if people you know i i don't know if you have any more of like your own managing or consultation slots open or um how people could reach you um like is there any like final like thoughts you'd like to let people know about yourself um so the best way to reach me right now is through twitter um you'll find me uh, on twitter as tessa underscore vt I have no management slots open currently, but I do accept consultations whenever. Um, even though like the expectation time for that may be about like a month or two out because of me focusing on other important events like debuts, like March is a very popular debut month. So I'm more focusing on that right now. And with Mari here, I'm trying to work on other things. And so um, to uh, that's why I limit my slots is so that I don't overwork myself. And so um, I am accepting consultations, but there are a lot of other very valuable people out there. And again, like I said, um, I'm not the highest priority. You need to focus on like if you're like starting out, don't worry about getting a manager. You're not missing out on a whole lot and you need to focus on your priorities you need to figure out more about yourself focus on what your priorities actually are figure out what it is you actually want to do try it out a bit and then maybe consider finding a manager or a consultant that would be my biggest advice for 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 people with like a lot of people i handle because i i don't like going on autopilot a whole lot anymore um and this is me being completely transparent and honest. I uh, it, I always like money, but like, I I think the best bang for your buck and use of your time is if you've already tried stuff and you want help getting specifics on how to execute stuff, how to actually improve, and you need a very specific on hands kind of approach, then yeah, get someone like me or someone else um, to to take a very close look at it and to. Um, help you Im improve very specifically. The more specific you are and the more stuff you have coming into a consultation or at, or management with anyone, the better time you're going to have. And the more work that you put in, the more work your manager can also put in in, in turn. It's it's a team effort. And so that that's mm. also just some advice for, you know, potentially red flags, but also green flags is yeah. if you yourself are putting in the effort as well. 
I liked that. Yeah. I Wow, Tessa. Thank, thank you for shifting the perspective, at least for me, on how all this works. Because I know, like, I hire you for this stuff, but I never really, like, knew all of that stuff that goes into the behind the scenes. And I'm very... Same with the other managers who I reached out to that got back to me. Like, thank you so much for responding because it really opened up my perspective just how much all of you do for... For people like me who are really trying to become like a full-time creator who really want to like have my own brand and really like make something and I, i'm just very appreciative of all of the people who put their heart and souls and believing into creators like me in the fact that like one day like we will become successful as long as we keep trying keep trying different things looking back at the data and see if it if it works if it doesn't work trying something else figure out why the day didn't work if it did work figure out why it worked and continue going on from there and like i really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today and yeah like thank you so much for everything i i guess um if you'd like to say any any last final words you're more than welcome to <laughs> <laughs> of course um someone uh, someone's asking if i'm going to be coming back for another episode i don't i i have no idea but um I was happy to help represent VTuber managers at least the, the best of what we could, what we could be um, and give a better insight and perspective in all this. And with, with Mari's podcast here, she's aiming with this podcast, My Virtual Life, to be able to give you guys insight into the back end of content creation and VTubing and the things that people don't normally talk about online. And she has more episodes that she wants to plan, and I'm going to help her plan those things. Um, if you guys have any requests for topics and guests, please let us know. And you know how to reach Mari. She has a Discord. So please give feedback, and that is always appreciated for everything that she does. If you give feedback, she listens. That is a very valuable thing, and I always appreciate working with Mari. I, and... Y'all don't know me very well, but I know you very well. I, I have to look at everything. And so one thing I have to say is thank you for being so amazing to Mari and being so supportive of her brand transition. And I want to encourage you to continue supporting her no matter what. And ah. I think there I think there's big things coming for, for everyone. And so I hope you look forward to a lot more announcements from her. Yes, there are big things coming. Thank you, Tessa. With that, everyone, remember, as I've always said before, everything reminds you of something. Bye, everyone.